If you can please take your seats. I will now call this meeting to order. Would you please stand for the national anthem? Please remain standing for a moment of silence, and during this time, please remember Suzanne Beard, Vincenzo Frangipane, Dr. Skip Wentworth James, and Thomas Ian Ronald. Thank you. Yes, one moment, please, Councillor Ainsley. Yes, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Just good morning, everyone. Just before we start, I just want to acknowledge uh, that it was Councillor Ford's birthday yesterday, and I'd like to oh. wish him a, a happy birthday He's and many old. more. He's nineteen. Thank you. We acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territory of Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron, Wendat, and home to many diverse Indigenous peoples. For the benefit of those who are connected to the Internet, the City Clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meeting at toronto.ca slash council. Members, we have a presentation this morning to recognize Deputy City Manager John Livy on his retirement from the City of Toronto. I would like to call upon City Manager Peter Wallace to come forward for the presentation. Thank you, and the quality of my voice will ensure I'm brief today. Um, John, I wanted to say four quick, but I think important uh, things. The first is uh, a very profound uh, thanks on my behalf and on the behalf of your team for your leadership. You have been uh, a stalwart for the City of Toronto. You have worked incredibly hard, but you have actually contributed your time, energy, creativity to helping all of us uh, to an enormous extent. And if I look around the room and I see the executives from Cluster B, I see the uh, folks from the other clusters, and I realize that you have been involved in all of their careers. You have been constructive, creative, extraordinarily helpful to our uh, IT folks, to our financial folks, to your own people, and of course to the team from Cluster A as, as well. You've had a citywide impact, and I want to thank you for, uh, for that. I also want to thank you for your personal effort in helping me join the City of Toronto and helping me understand a little bit better the world in which this, uh, in which this glorious corporation enterprise uh, works. You have had a, an astonishing impact on the City because of your tireless capacity to get stuff done. And just every single day I've been privileged to work with you and we've all been privileged to work with you, you solve problems. You come to work, you find the problems, you solve them, you work with councillors, you work with staff, you work across divisions, you work with other governments, you work with developers, you work with the private sector, and you actually, every single day, get stuff done. 
It's just been absolutely magnificent to work uh, with you. You bring a, a human quality to the leadership that, that we should never underestimate. And that, that human quality is maybe best understood or best exemplified in your, your leadership in the United Way. And the City of Toronto runs one of the, the best, if not the very best, leadership campaigns in the entire country. And it's a, a campaign that is unique in terms of our contribution of both management and labour. It's a corporate culture that comes together in the civic run, that comes together in our, in our civic uh, gala. John, you have been the leader of that the entire time. You've just simply been a fantastic, fantastic contributor. And I think that speaks volume to your, your capacity. And we know, we know absolutely that Daniele and the team are going to miss you profoundly in terms of, of uh, those. Um, we're not actually, I don't think, saying goodbye. I think the truth is that, that this is a, a different direction for you. You will take some time off. I'm sure you'll do some fishing. I'm sure you'll play some golf. I'm sure you'll do some other things. But I expect fully to see you back in, in the world and continue to, continuing to uh, contribute to the, uh, the economy. And one of the reasons that I know that's going to happen is we have a little slide that we want to put up here. And John, you've seen this before. But it is, it's a little bit hokey, but I, I was trying to struggle to try and capture basically, you know, how do we actually understand what John has done? And, and we can talk about all the people he's developed, we can talk about all the United Way stuff and all of those other things, but John is first and foremost a planner. And you can actually see his legacy. You can actually see his legacy, especially the future legacy, in the fabric of the city of Toronto. And if you look in almost every corner of this amazing place, you will see projects that John has conceived driven, found the funding for, made into reality. Not all of them are reality yet, but they will all become reality. It is a profoundly important contribution. And I think the best way, at least for me, to understand John is to look at, basically project ourselves into a future. Call it 2031. Call it some other time. But look and imagine the city back at that time. At that time, look back from there. It's going to be a profoundly different, profoundly better place because the reality is there's going to be a tremendous amount more infrastructure, more parks, more transit, the waterfront, every corner of the city. John, you have driven that, our extraordinary appreciation. Thank you so much. Mayor. Well, Peter, um, thank you for your words, and I won't repeat them, although they're all deserving of repetition. And I will just say that I think the uh, Liv Livy's legacy was far from uh, whatever word you used, uh, uh, tacky or whatever it was. I think it was perfectly appropriate to illustrate, uh, and it could have been a much bigger poster, frankly, if it uh, could be shipped uh, anywhere uh, if it was bigger. And I just want to say, uh, really, just to sort of emphasize a couple of the points that uh, Peter made, that we're here today to honor and to say thank you for a remarkable public service career um, that extends back before the time that uh, John was with uh, the City of Toronto, but certainly uh, focuses on the time that he spent here and that it is, uh, I came to realize even in my own short time here uh, that, you know, John was one of those people that's a get things done. Uh, person and I made humorous ref passing reference at the uh, uh, tribute the other day, which I should say uh, some of you were there was attended by hundreds of people, which is in of itself in and of itself a testament to um, a, a, a career very well spent in in public service. But there were occasionally collateral consequences. But John recognized, as as many of us do, and certainly I do, having spent a bit of time here now, that a failure to get things done doesn't uh, you know doesn't um, serve this government well in terms of all the things we can do and are capable of doing and he helped us uh, to get things uh, done and so I think the Libby's legacy with all the projects that it showed I made mention of one the other day it's recent it's not the biggest but the Bentway project I can tell you just because I had personal involvement in that the this great iconic park yet to be finished but certainly got open it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for John Olivia. It just wouldn't have happened. I mean, it certainly wouldn't be open yet. It might have opened some other time down the road, but it wouldn't uh, have happened. I made mention the other day, and I think it's very important, and Peter again made passing reference to this, that um, I always think that people that become extraordinary leaders like John usually have more dimensions to them. And while I didn't see any of it, in fact, I only heard about it, um, you know, John's uh, passion for music, his passion for scuba diving, for fishing. I mean, this is a multi-dimensional man, and I think that that often, you know, leads to greater contributions at work because you have all these dimensions uh, in your life. And uh, I just want to fo focus on the one that 
Peter mentioned as well, because it was so, it's so important to me as someone who's had a lifelong, literally a career-long involvement with the United Way, but so has John. It isn't his involvement here. It is, and Daniele Zignotti, the CEO of the United Way, spoke so well of this the other day and said things that I hadn't heard before um, in, in as much kind of detail, which was when the York Region United Way was foundering, and oftentimes it's more difficult than for the ones in the really big cities, you know, the, where all the financial industries and so on are concentrated, uh, who did he call when he was the CEO of that organization to kind of help them get themselves out of their doldrums? John Livy. And John has not only had that involvement, it wasn't a one-time rescue mission, but he stayed involved to the point where, as we all know here, he has uh, headed up in partnership with the labor movement, uh, uh, successful campaigns here, and really the model of labor management cooperation on raising money for the United Way here is one that is admired and replicated across uh, the country, and I think that's something that tells you a lot about him as well. Uh, it isn't about the campaign structure or the process or labor management cooperation, but it's about a commitment that goes back decades and has been continued year after year uh, in favor of helping other people in our great city to uh, get a bit of a hand up they sometimes need. So John, I want to say uh, congratulations. I want to say thank you. I want to say that we will miss you because um, you are a rare uh, come from a rare breed of people who just know how to get things done and have a, such a wide area of expertise. But I want to quote the great Louis Armstrong. I thought we should quote a musician. And Louis Armstrong once said that musicians don't retire, they stop when there's no music in them. And in that regard, I would say that I think, from my surmising, just as Peter said, uh, you've got a lot of music left in you, you've got a lot of public service left in you one way or another, and I think you've got a lot of community service left in you too. And so I suspect in any or all of those fronts, and I could add fishing and scuba diving and all the other golfing, um, we will see lots of you, and I hope we will. But thank you for a job very well done for the people of the City of Toronto and for the members of this council and those who preceded them. Thank you. John, uh, the only mistake you make is you keep picking these organizations like the United Way, where, as you know, the most they ever give you. Did they give you a T-shirt the other day in that <laughs> bag? A plaque. Or a plaque. But you get a plaque or a T-shirt, and then the city of Toronto, no different. But uh, I hope you know that regardless of what else might come from some other kind of organization, <laughs> this comes uh, with all the sincerity and gratitude that it possibly can. Um, and I hope this will find a place of pride in your home uh, so that you can remember your years of service, as we will, uh, for sure. Thanks again, Mr. Thank you. Come on out here. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's been a privilege. I wanted to acknowledge from at the very beginning my wife, Cheryl, my brother, Gordon, my daughter, Allison, and my uh, son, Andrew, are joining us today, and I'm so happy that they're able to be with me today. Um, thank you, everybody, all members of council, all members of staff, the public, for your uh, support, encouragement, and best wishes. I especially want to thank Peter, my deputy city managers, Joe Frag, Wendy Wahlberg, uh, and especially all the staff in Cluster B and throughout the organization for their support and hard work. Um, otherwise, um, one couldn't have, has, have succeeded. Uh, when I joined the city staff in the middle of the core services review in 2011, I had only a rough idea of what was involved as a deputy city manager, how much work was involved. No matter what experience you've had elsewhere in government or business, how much homework you do, how studious you are in trying to anticipate the demands of working in this city, no one can really appreciate what we go through here at City Hall. It's a special place. Often described as drinking from a fire hose, the huge volume of information, history, personalities, issues, large and small, 
local complaints, big policy issues, exceedingly complex, difficult files. That's what the plight place is like in day in and day out. To succeed, you have to accept the messiness, the political to and fro, and at the same time see the possibilities to solve problems and get good outcomes. Part of this volume on chaos can be attributed to the size of the city and the sheer growth we're experiencing. I always like to remind people that the whole of the Greater Toronto Area prior to the Second World War was only a million people. Now we're seven million. Toronto and the GTA have, has arguably been North America's most attractive city region, especially in the last 20 years. Um, and at times, I'm not sure we as staff, council, the media, or the public truly appreciate how fortunate we are to have these problems and challenges. They are true opportunities. How staff and city council respond to this fire hose of unrelenting supply of challenges and opportunities is vital to our future's prospects. And this is the last time I have an opportunity to, direct, to uh, address, address you as DCM and to suggest some ways of doing um, how, how it is that we can do things in a much more useful way. So first, my observations. I hope you're, you're ready for this. First, I have to say that this is the most democratic place in, in which I've ever worked. You as a council have a strong tradition of working with your communities, engaging the public, encouraging debate, providing access to decision making through committees, advisory groups, it goes on, community councils, whatever. Like you guys do a great job of engaging your public. You should be proud of this and you should build on that tradition. I want to give you some observation on the way we work, the things that hold us back, and uh, I, I just have to say, these are my thoughts, my thoughts alone. I'm fully uh, accountable for the uh, comments that I'm going to make. Um, first off, we try to do too many things all at the same time. There are too many disparate efforts, too much piling on. Too often we focus, we lack focus, and where we do focus, we do not organize our work effectively enough to get uh, timely results. You have great staff. They're committed, talented, but they're sent on too many errands. Our energy is not focused on the most important things. Here are some suggestions. First, fall through on the idea of creating a permanent rapid transit expansion secretariat. Unify the capital planning, project management, finance, procurement, intergovernmental, legal, TTC expertise under a single unit. Uh, for the half dozen major rapid transit initiatives that must be delivered in a timely way. Relief line, smart track, Scarborough tra Transit, East Eglinton, East and West, Waterfront. Headed up with a DCM level professional reporting to the city manager and on to executive. Two, support council's priority on affordable housing by consulting the disparate functions promoting affordable housing in an affordable housing secretary. Beef up the affordable housing office, supplement it with the resources from city uh, planning, policy, resources from the city manager, finance and legal to focus and coordinate these efforts. Focus on inclusionary zoning. While there's some new federal dollars for bricks and mortar programs, especially for shelter and deep poverty, there's, there won't be nearly enough to meet the incredible needs of this city for affordable housing. A robust solution for inclusionary zoning must be found, one that does not perpetuate the misconception that local municipalities should subsidize what is clearly a provincial and federal program that should be funded from jurisdictions that collect income taxes. Staff it with a DCM level leader and report directly to the city manager to executive committee. I know both of these suggestions disrupt the conventional divisional structures by forming multidisciplinary teams reporting directly to the city manager. It gives priority and emphasis to these projects above all other competing values and cultures in individual divisions. All purchasing, financial control, HR authorities, etc., should be aligned to make this happen. Three, modernize and streamline our work processes and controls. First, reform the budget from a control tool to a more strategic document. Simplify it. Eliminate the repetition and the excruciating detail and make it easier to publish and distribute the budget well in advance of budget committee meetings. Two, Expect the city manager and the chief transformation to deliver long-standing modernization initiatives, e-time, shared services, IT projects, and expect a quarterly progress report at general management committee, government management committee. Have a customer-centric focus at the heart of all we do and support it with mandatory customer service training for everyone. 
all staff. C, tie the performance management system for all staff to clear expectations for modernization across the organization. Until you do that, modernization will remain on the side of everyone's desk. And above all else, the new city manager will have to address a multitude of overlapping controls and cumbersome processes. As Peter Drucker, the management guru, says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Unfortunately, control is our default culture. Rarely do we re reward risk-taking or new ideas, the essential skills in building great organizations. Everyone should work hard to change this if you want the city to reach its full potential. Now, for everybody over 40, you'll remember Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift's novel. I want you to just think of Gulliver lying on that beach, staked down, tied down by strings. I want you to cut those strings and let Gulliver stand up and see the potential that this city can realize. Number, uh, number four, give your staff more time to do their work. Ask the city clerk and the city manager to come up with a plan to be enacted in January 2019 that will streamline council committee meetings and, and, and council meetings. The goal should be a two-day council meeting maximum. <laughs> Save everyone time at council committees by reaching out to staff to ask questions and motions in advance. Last week, Peter Wallace and the DCMs presented the long-term financial plan to executive committee. There are numerous key actions and commentary on the, fit, the city's financial prospects. It is worth reading and, and taking heed of it. For me, the debate really isn't about whether or not we can better manage costs, raise revenues beyond inflation to grow the city. The debate should be how do we manage costs and raise revenues in a way that will see all of the city's residents in all parts of the city prosper from these investments. Too many parts of the city have not benefited from the city's growth and should, we should renew efforts to address this deliberately, consciously. Yes, you have a difficult revenue tool debate coming uh, next year. You're going to have a tough debate on revenue tools. But if this city, with all its diversity, energy and intellect, can't solve it, who can? F. Scott Fitzgerald, remember the great Gatsby, said, the test of a fir first rate intelligence is to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Well, you've done that at budget time every year since I've been here. You do well not to have to pass this test next year or subsequent years. Your intellectual energy should focus relentlessly on building this city. This city is growing because people from across the world choose to invest and create their futures here. They recognize that this city is a special place and will support your efforts. I hope you find these comments helpful, not critical. And in conclusion, I want to thank you for all the support and encouragement these last seven years. As members of the Toronto City Council, yours is not an easy job, and I hope I've been able to help you in serving the people of this great city. You deserve a large vote of thanks for your community leadership and the incredible hours of service that you all provide. It's been my privilege to work with each and every one of you, and I look forward, I will look forward and, 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 uh, with working with you at some time in the future. Uh, in the meantime, I wish every one of you uh, good health, good luck, good fortune. Thank you, John. <laughs> Councillor Shan, I understand that you wish to make a brief announcement at this time. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As you know, in a few days we'll be entering April. In every April, Ontarians celebrate Be a Donor Month in support of uh, awareness and promotion of organ and tissue donation registration. So uh, with collaboration with the uh, Trillium Gift of Life Network, I would like to invite all councillors to participate in the creating of awareness. There, is, uh, there are some materials on your desk, at your desk, uh, a letter that details about uh, what the campaign is asking, um, and a ribbon. 
Uh, now, last year, the mayor and six councillors participated through social media in promotion. We are hoping that we can do much better this year with many more councillors participating. Today during lunchtime, uh, my office and Trillium Gift of Life Network will be uh, offering to videotape you for the video message, 10, 15 seconds to, to help you get out of that uh, workload that you might have in logistics. So please come by during lunchtime. I just wanted to say that, you know, Registration in Toronto is at 22%, 10% below the provincial average, whereas we have one of the phenomenal transplant facilities uh, in, in the world. And, uh, and we, we hope that with your support, uh, we can uh, save lives. One, one donor saves eight lives. Uh, one donor can save eight lives, and it takes only two minutes to register. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Layton, uh, you would like to make an uh, announcement? Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to rise quickly and thank the men and women of Toronto Fire Services. We, they had a very busy weekend in our neighbourhood with three fires, the last being a three-alarm fire on DuPont Street, a house fire. Um, there was reports of an injury amongst the uh, uh, Toronto Fire Service. I'm happy to say uh, that that individual is home with his family and, and is fine. Um, but I just wanted to thank them. We know that it's a dangerous job that they have. They put their lives on the line uh, any time of day uh, when they're called into duty. Uh, and I thank them very much for the service to uh, our neighbourhood this past weekend. Thank you. I will now call for a motion to confirm the minutes. Councillor Carroll, you have a motion on the minutes from the last two meetings. I do, Madam Speaker. That City Council confirm the minutes of Council from the regular meeting held on January 31st and February 1st, 2018, and the special meeting held on February 12th, 2018, in the form supplied to the members. Thank you. All in favor? Carry. Members of Council, we have the following administrative inquiries from Councillor Davis before us today. Administrative Inquiry 38.1 on the status of negotiations on shared use agreements for the Toronto District School Board. And Administrative Inquiry 38.2 on the status of the review of current traffic control warrant measures. The General Manager Parks, Forestry and Recreation and the General Manager Transportation Services have submitted answers to these inquiries as part of the supplementary and additional packages. May I have a motion to receive the inquiries and answers for for information. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On item one, I would like to move that the item be referred to the Community Development and Recreation Committee for consideration. It has to do with the agreements that have been expired since amalgamation, and we need to discuss this. And I'd like to refer it to the Community <coughs> Development and Recreation Committee. On the second item, um, I'm happy with having it received for information and look forward to the report that's coming in May. Okay, so we'll vote on the um, uh, administrative inquiry 38.1 first. All in favor? Carried. On 38.2, all in favor? Carried. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce their reports. The chairs can speak about the reports for up to five minutes. Mayor Tor, you have a motion to introduce the executive committee report. Uh, I do thank you, Madam Speaker, that uh, the report for meeting 32 of the Executive Committee listed on the agenda of Council uh, be presented for consideration. And I will simply say there are many different items we spent. Uh, and I think one of the important things to mention about the meeting just in passing was that it took place in the uh, Scarborough Civic Centre. And it's something that was meant to be, uh, when I say an experiment, that we would try to have a formal a meeting of the executive committee outside of the city hall i uh, think and we're going to sort of review it in the context of the challenges that it posed for the clerk's office and i extend again my thanks to them as i did in scarborough uh, but i think that uh, notwithstanding those challenges it was a great success because i think certainly the people who came out and found it easier perhaps to come out and participate in their civic government uh, from Scarborough, uh, I think appreciated it. I think they appreciated the fact that what we're trying to do is make sure people don't always have to sort of be here or come here uh, and that we are uh, one city. And so I would hope we'll be able to do it again, perhaps in the new uh, term of council and set up some kind of a standard whereby we do it perhaps once a year in different parts of the city. And I'll draw only attention, Madam Speaker, to just uh, the one series of items that's uh, included in the executive committee agenda to do with affordable housing and point out that when you add them up, 
uh, some division as between ownership and rental. Uh, these measures that are before you today from the Executive Committee with their recommendation uh, are uh, 324 uh, units of housing. And you know, um, it, it's frustrating in one respect because we know, of course, the lists uh, that exist for people to have access to those uh, home ownership and home uh, rent, those rent affordable rental opportunities are far in excess of that. But we just have to keep um, moving forward uh, to meet our own targets and trying to find ways we can do things on a much scaled up uh, version, but I think these are positive steps forward today, albeit that they're modest relative, pardon me, to the size of the challenge. And so I commend uh, the report uh, of the Executive Committee to you, and in particular these items that will, again, uh, make a contribution to our affordable ho housing challenge. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, you have a motion to introduce the Audit Committee report. I do. Good morning to you, Madam Speaker, and to the members of Council, that the report from meeting 11 of the Audit Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. I'll take a moment to highlight that there are five items uh, before us from the Audit Committee. Uh, some of those are periodic and familiar to this Council. Uh, often they occur every year, and some are unique. Uh, but I will remind members that all were reviewed in detail and, and or debated at the Committee. Um, for example, um, demonstrating value of the Auditor General's office. Uh, we are reminded in that report that over the last five years, the Auditor General has produced 72 audits, 745 recommendations, leading to a cost savings of $203 million. And that is for the bargain price of $23.9 million to run the Auditor General's office over the last five years. Also, though, and, and the auditor quantifies many of these audits, but there are the non-quantifiable benefits. And I'll remind members of council of some of the recent things that we've heard about. For instance, the uh, report from the Auditor General on MLS focusing on eating establishments and nightclubs. And of course, how can we forget about the holistic centers? Um, there was also reports on employee health and dental benefits that council talked about, and a report on Union Station. So those benefits may not be quantifiable, but they're very, very important because many of them produce new processes. They allow management to enact change in their divisions. They increase transparency and most importantly, they increase public confidence in this government. I'll also talk about the fraud and waste hotline report. In five years, the fraud and waste hotline generated 3,137 complaints. And in 2017 alone, there were 680 complaints leading to 1,060 allegations. And the value of those complaints were quantified as up to $17 million. What's important about this, and what I think is the key message for members of council and the public, is that the Auditor General has a process to deal with the fraud and waste hotline, and every allegation is checked. And through that process, the allegation may be investigated further, and from those even further lead to either a change through the management in the division or an actual audit itself. And the report goes on to talk about that. I will summarize just to uh, thank the Auditor General for her work and ask members of Council through you, Madam Speaker, of one um, logistical uh, request that if you did choose to hold one of these uh, encompassing reports that deals with multiple staff divisions, such as the Fraud and Waste Hotline, <coughs> you speak to the Auditor or speak to myself so that we can ensure the correct uh, member of staff is uh, present in the room to answer your questions and can, we can deal with anything that may have to go in camera. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Menon-Wong, you have a motion to introduce the Civic Appointments Committee report? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. That the report for meeting 20 of the Civic Appointments Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the Community Development and Recreation Committee report? Yes, I do, Madam Speaker, that the report for meeting 26 of the Community Development and Recreation Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Uh, I'd like to thank my committee members for being the lead on shelter services and tackling the homelessness. I would like to um, thank my committee members for making this a, a priority and a vital conversation. Of course, thank the mayor for making this uh, his key item. 
in the package before you uh, in discussion are 21 motions primarily generated from uh, committee members which will uh, create a robust conversation and also add to the growing need to plug the holes in our shelter system. My only word of caution is when I look back to December of 2017, uh, our committee brought to Council 26 motions uh, to try and fix and repair our shelter and respite system, many of which have missed their deadline, have not been responded to. These number of motions are just piling up and we're falling further and further behind in creating a framework uh, that really reforms and improves our shelter and homelessness strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, you have a motion to introduce the Economic Development Committee report. I do, Speaker, and good morning, everyone. Good morning, Speaker. That the report for meeting 27 of Economic Development Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ains, do you have a motion to introduce the Government Management Committee report? Good morning, Madam Speaker. Uh, that the report for meeting number 25 of the Government Management Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor McMahon, you have a motion to introduce the Parks and Environment Committee report? I do. Thank you very much. Good morning, collegial colleagues, and to uh, Mr. Levy, who, I don't know, I hope he's on a beach in Hawaii already, but thank you <laughs> for all you've done for, for us in this chamber and for the city at large. Uh, I call you Yoda, and you, have, <laughs> you solve every problem that exists, and we will sorely miss you. Um, so that the report from meeting 25 of the Parks and Environment Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And we had a robust debate about PE 25.1, tree protection through the Committee of Adjustment, which I know you all love trees in this uh, chamber and you never want to remove them. Uh, and it was very um, interesting and enlightening and I noticed that Councillor Fillion has held the item, so we will continue it here, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shiner, you have a motion to introduce the Planning and Growth Management Committee report. I do, Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting 27 of the Planning and Growth Management Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration in my ongoing uh, information session about affordable housing. There were only 167 units that we approved or are approving in, in this current agenda. There's no affordable housing units in there at all. So when we talk about inclusionary zoning, we should be sure, if we really believe in it, we should be including it in the applications as it go through. In regards to the item on the committee, uh, there is one item, PG 27.5, Townhouse and Low Rise uh, Apartment Guidelines, which I've held. It is uh, very difficult work that has gone on between the planning division and many members of the industry that came to an accommodation and guidelines that both sides thought they were very comfortable with. I know my colleague, Councillor Perks, has an issue in regards to the location of front doors, which might work in, and does work in his community to be different than what is in the staff report. But this is a citywide one, and I hope when we get to the debate, we'll understand that we have to look at these from a citywide basis. And there were some amendments that were made there that I don't support. I think that the staff report was a great accommodation, an awful lot of hard work between the staff and the industry and it is guidelines that everyone could work by and I will be asking you when we get to it to support the staff recommendations. Yeah. <coughs> Councillor Robinson, you have a motion to introduce the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee report. Yes, thank you Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting 27 of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, do you have a motion to introduce the Tobacco York Community Council report? Yes, I do. And good morning, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting 28 of the Tobacco York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And why I'm up, Madam Speaker, I'd also would like to personally thank uh, John Livy in the public forum for not everything he's done for the city, but the residents of Ward 6. I'd like to thank him for his service, and uh, it was a pleasure to work with him. Thank you. 
Councilor Ajumeri, you have a motion to introduce the North York Community Council report. Thank you. Yes, that the report from meeting 28 of the North York Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councilor Holland. You have a motion to introduce the Scarborough Community Council report. Yes, good morning, Madam Speaker. And so that the report for meeting 28 of Scarborough Community Council listed on the agenda of council will be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam, you have a motion to introduce the Toronto and East York Community Council report. Uh, yes, I do, Madam Speaker, and thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce that the report from meeting 30 of the Toronto and East Shore Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. And with that, to also thank our city clerks who did a great job of shepherding 93 items uh, through our agenda. Uh, and uh, we recognize that that is uh, significantly more than Scarborough Community Council with 12 items, North York Community Council with 27 items, and Etobicoke York at commu at Community Council with 34 items. Um, thank you very much. Councillor Fragadakis, you have a motion to introduce the new business and business previously requested from city officials. Yeah, that new business and business previously requested from city officials listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. All those in favor of the motions, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tan, please. Councillor Mahavik, please. The motion to introduce new business carries unanimously. 38 in favor. Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the committee, the item, or motion number, and the nature of the, in of the interest. Councillor Pasternak. Yes, out of an abundance of caution, I'd like to declare an interest on page 5, CA 20.2, appointment of public members of the Toronto Public Library Board. Technically, my wife is still an employee of the Toronto Public Library. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, sorry, I just lost the page here. My apologies. Oh, yes, it's on page 6, GM 25.6, termination of the offer to donate land from Mount Pleasant Group of Cemeteries to the City of Toronto. Uh, I initiated legal proceedings along with Friends of Toronto Public Cemeteries uh, against, uh, and the name appellants are the uh, Queen, sorry, Her Majesty the Queen in Right of Ontario, the Public Guardian, and the Trustee and Mount Pleasant Group of Cemeteries. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Page 9, SC 28.12, Heavy Vehicle Prohibition, Pharmacy Avenue between Nelsmere Road and Eglinton Avenue. I own a transportation company. My trucks could be traveling on that, so I'll take a bow on that. Huh? Thank you. I will now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time? If you can clear the screen, please. Are there any petitions? Members, I will now review the order paper. We have two deferred items on this agenda. EY 23.73, a draft approval of condominium 2522-2542 Keel Street, integrity, transparency, and accountability and fairness in the planning process. And EY 25.40, a status report on 2522-42 Keel Street, draft plan of standard uh, condominium application. The mayor um, has designated the following items as his key matters for this meeting. The first key matter will be item CD 26.5 headed emergency shelter service update. 
The second key matter will be item CC 38.3, headed Ombudsman Toronto Report Inquiry into City of Toronto Winter Respite Services in 2017 and 18 season. Uh, these will be our first and second item of business today. I also propose that the following items be considered together. Item EY 2373 on draft approval of condominium 2522-42 Keel Street and EY 25.40 on status report of 2522-42 Keel Street and item EY 28.3 on draft plan of, sta of standard condominium application for 2522 and 2542 uh, Keel Street request for uh, direction uh, that uh, these items be uh, um, dealt with at the same time. Members of uh, notices of motions are scheduled to be dealt with at 2 p.m. tomorrow only if the mayor's key matters have been completed. I propose a city council set a time for a closed session if required later in the meeting. Members of council, um, oh, um, the, the with. So members of council, before I take additional holds, I wish to advise council on a matter that should be withdrawn from the agenda. The city solicitor has advised the North York Community Council item 28.26 on representation at the Toronto Local Appeal Body hearing for 12 Catherine Road has already been dealt with under delegated authority granted by city council at its January 2018 meeting. That, meeting, that item is now redundant and, and will be withdrawn from the agenda. The city clerk has noted the items that members wish to hold. I will not go through the items listed on the order paper to take additional holds, and I will recognize requests to make matters urgent and time specific after I go through the items for additional holds. Once the order paper has been approved by council, any ch change will need a two thirds vote. Page three. Councillor DiGiorgio. <coughs> Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. Um, I have no problem in dealing with the um, the items as you proposed all together. So I'm holding EY 23.73 and EY 25.40 along with the item that you would deal uh, at Etobicoke York Community Council so that they can all be dealt at the same time. I'm just um, getting some motions ready so I'm, I'm holding those items. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Councillor uh, Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, on page three, item EX 32.7, rehabilitation of the Western, Donald, Western Channel Dock Wall, I can actually release that. I don't need to hold that. Okay, on page three, EX 32.7, Councillor Cressy is releasing. All in favor? Recorded. Recorded. Councillor Davis, please. Right. Councillor Fragadakis, Councillor Crisanti, please. The motion carries unanimously, 38 in favor. Deputy Mayor Menon Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to hold. Uh, EX 32.8, Strategic Development of Low-Carbon Thermal Energy Networks. Uh, what? Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. EX 32.11, Indigenous Business Initiative. Thank you. Okay, Paige, we can clear the screen. Page four, Councillor Perks. Uh, thank you, Speaker, um, and good morning. Uh, unfortunately, I seem to have whatever it is the, uh, the city manager has, so if you'll bear with me. I think I got it, by the way, Thursday at the deputy city manager's celebration as part of his effort to streamline government. I have this. Um, <laughs> Councillor Perks, I have the same thing, too. Yeah, I think he got a lot of us. Uh, 
I would like to hold EX 32.21 cryptocurrency blockchain in the city of Toronto. Why? That's what I was <laughs> to refer it back. <coughs> Councillor Matlow. Madam Speaker, good morning. On uh, page four, I can release um, EX 32.20 request for expansion of open data information to include applications for above the guideline rent increases. Okay, on page four, EX 3220, Councillor Matlow is releasing on corded. Councillor Kelly, please. Councillor Mahavik and Councillor Holland, please. Councillor Hart, when you're seated. Councillor Wong Tam. Councillor Kelly, please. The item is adopted unanimously. 38 in favor. Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. EX 32.22, Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling. Uh, I need my glasses. Uh, funding programming. Program, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, AU on the Audit Committee, AU 11.3, IT Infrastructure and IT Asset Management Review. Okay. If we can clear the screen, please. Page 5, Councillor Fletcher. Yes, um, ED 27.8, Film Studio Infrastructure, please. Thank you. Page six. Councillor Fletcher. PG 27.3, 21 Don Valley Parkway, 30 Booth, 375, 385 Eastern Avenue, proposed modifications to official plan amendment 231, site and area specific, policy 426. I'm sorry, Councillor Fletcher, I didn't hear the item number. Sorry, it's PG 27.3. It's the first Gulf Union Weaver site. Okay, thank you. Page 7. Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, second item on the page, PG 27.7, Ontario Municipal Board, Appeal of Official Plan Amendment 231, Request for Directions. Councillor Grimes. <coughs> uh, page 7, top of page PG 27.6, Request for Reduction on Ontario Municipal Board, Appeals of Official Plan 231 and ICE Arena Permissions. Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Public Works 27.5, a school bus loading zone with Nona Drive, Ward 1721. Councillor Mallow. It's okay. <coughs> uh, Madam Speaker, page 7, PW 27.9, Metrolinks, Eglinton, Crosstown, RT, long term temporary traffic amendments. Can release it? To release it. Oh, you want to release it? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay, on page 7, PW 27.9, Councillor Mallow would like to release recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor Kelly, thank you. Councillor Cole, please. The item is adopted 37 to 1. Councillor DiGiorgio. Um, yeah, at, um, 
Item EY 28.3, Madam Speaker, consistent with your request. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, if we can clear the board, please. Page 8. Councillor Shiner. Uh, Madam Speaker, I can actually release NY 28.27, Chapter 4, 1, 5, Article Exemption, 4588 to 4600 Bathurst Street. That's real quick. Okay, on page 8, NY 2827, Councillor Shiner is releasing. Recorded. I was waiting for you, Councillor Fletcher. Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong, please. Councillor Holland, thank you. The item is adopted unanimously, 38 in favor. Councillor de Bearmaker. That's the new late name for the water. Thank you, Madam Street. Speaker. I think I can do a quick release on page 8, Scarborough Community Council. Uh, SC 28.7 <coughs> Traffic Control Signals Review, Eglinton Avenue East between Oswego Road to Barbados Boulevard, which is not code for the Scarborough Waterfront Trail. Uh, but Councillor Holland and I have been working with the French Catholic High School on the north side and some of the businesses on the south side and our staff who all have technical amendments. So I'm just going to move that this be referred back to the April 4th meeting of the Scarborough <coughs> Community Council for further consideration so we can uh, get everybody's input at the Community Council stage. Thank you. Okay, so the motion's on the screen. All in favor? Carried. Okay, page nine. Council Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I don't need to hold it, but I'd like a recorded vote on TE 30.9, 10 to 16 Wellesley Street West, 5 to 7 St. Nicholas Street, and 586 Young Street. Zoning amendment refusal report. Okay, so recorded vote on page 9, T 30.9. Recorded vote. Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Crisanti, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 38 in favor. Councillor Matlow. Madam Speaker, I'm releasing T30.14, demolition of a property subject to intention to designate under Part 1V, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act, 170 Merton Street. On page 9, the bottom of the page, T30.14, Councillor Matlow is releasing. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, Speaker, I'd like to hold page 9, TE30.13, 462 Eastern Avenue, Official Plan Amendment and Zoning Amendment Applications, Request for Direction. And with that, I believe, is TE30.19, uh, companion, the alterations to a heritage property intention to designate under Part 4, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act, an authority to enter into heritage easement agreement. And ask that they be dealt with together, Speaker, please. Thank you. Councillor Fragadakis. Uh, yeah, on page 9, I just want a recorded vote on item TE 30.10995 to 1005 Broadview Avenue and 2 to 4 Mortimer Avenue. Okay, recorded vote. <laughs> Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Cole, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 38 in favor. 
Yes, Council. Sorry, I have another item I wanted to have a recorded vote on. It's TE 30.11132 Broadview Avenue official plan amendment application. Okay, recorded vote. Councillor Carmichael, grab please. The item uh, is adopted unanimously, 38 in favor. Okay, if we can clear the screen, we'll go to page 10. Councillor Fletcher. Sorry, that was uh, no, coming off. Okay, Annie on page 10. Okay, we'll go to page 11. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, CC 38.1, suitability of identified property as a proposed shelter. Councillor Troisi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to move to adopt the recommendation in the supplementary report for CC 38.8, 254 to 266 King Street East. And just a sec. Um, <coughs> hey, hold on, hold on. This is on CC 38.8. Page 11, CC yes. 38.8. Okay, just a sec. Councillor Wong Tam, do you have an item? Uh, did you want to speak on this one? Uh, I had an interest in, uh, in this matter. I wanted to ask some questions of staff. Okay, so Councillor well, Troisi, would you like to hold it? Okay. Councillor Wong Tam, was that the item then? Okay. Um, Councillor Matlow, are, are you on page 11? Uh, actually, 10. 10. Yeah. Okay, on page 10, Councillor Matlow. Madam Speaker, uh, page 10, TE 30.54, construction area, staging area, 1955 Young Street. The uh, pedestrian access and all lanes are going to remain open. So you're releasing? I'm releasing it. Okay. So on page 10, T30.54, Councillor Matlow's releasing. All in favor? Carried. Okay. If we can clear the screen, please. Mayor Tory. No, I'm just going to declare an interest. Uh, I forgot to declare. Mayor Tory has an, has yeah. an interest. I, uh, Madam Speaker, I apologize to Council and to you. I forgot to declare an interest. I just didn't hear it go by. And uh, on item uh, CC38.9, um, I, I deal with these on a case-by-case -case basis, but out of an abundance of caution, my mother uh, resides in a condominium that's uh, close by the area that's affected by this item, and so I'll uh, declare an interest in that regard. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, thank you. Staff just passed a note. Could I please hold on page 9? TE 30.7545 Commissioner Street, City Initiated Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application. So I'd like to hold that, Speaker, please. Page 9. Thank you. Councillor Cressy, we're on page 12. Did you want something on page 12? Uh, thank you, Speaker. Item CC 38.12, 400 Front Street, request for direction. Uh, I'd like to hold that as a report is due. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, page 12. Thank you, Madam Speaker. CC uh, 3011, medical judge and secretary plan. There's a report due. I'll hold that in my name. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. I have a procedural motion. I would like to move that in accordance with Section 2760 of Council Procedure, City Council remove item EX 32.1, headed City of Toronto Long-Term Financial Plan from the Executive Committee and bring the item forward to City Council for consideration. I would also like to speak to that motion, Speaker. Yeah. Okay, um, Councillor Davis, do you have a question? Uh, Councillor, uh, I was wondering, no? Ask. I have already asked. Okay. 
No, I'm, I want to speak. I believe I speak to my motion before I'm asked questions on it. Okay, let yeah. Councillor Perks speak first. Yeah, I speak and then you ask questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Perks. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, like several members of council, I went out to the executive committee meeting in Scarborough uh, earlier this month, and I was able to ask a number of questions of the city manager and the fin financial planning staff. And the answers that I got uh, in respect to those questions, together with a reading of that document, made me even more concerned. Essentially, the city manager has said that the city of Toronto has a choice. Has a choice about which future we want to live in. Do we want to live in a future where we, as a government, provide only bare bones services to properties? Whether we continue with the suite of services that we currently have and increase our tax revenue, or whether we implement many of the city building initiatives we have passed as a council and implement even more significant tax increases in order to achieve that future. He said that in his report that you can't have your cake and eat it too in this instance. You can't pass bare bone revenue strategies and city building agendas simultaneously. The report points out that the consequence of trying to do this is that over the next five years, we have $1.4 billion difference between the revenues that we raise annually and the amount that we will be spending annually. In other words, the next term of council has to find something pretty close to a billion dollars in new revenues and or cuts to the services that we deliver for the City of Toronto to be on a healthy financial footing. I can think of no more urgent conversation for this council to have. I can think of no more important debate for Torontonians to have than whether we are a bare bones government that just delivers property services to property like sewer hookups and fire trucks and police and that's about it or whether we deliver the suite of services that a modern city has to deliver to be inclusive to be fair to be livable and to maintain great neighborhoods and wonderful places to shop wonderful places to work and wonderful places to play it's the fundamental conversation of the city and I believe that each of us who four years ago went to the voters in the city of Toronto and said, I would like you to support me so that I can go and be a leader on your behalf at Toronto City Council. I think each of us made a promise to have the courage to have that kind of a conversation. If you asked people to vote for you and were not prepared to face hard truths, you made an error. But many of us are going to be seeking re-election and I think it's incumbent on all of us who will be seeking re-election to make it absolutely known which side of that debate we stand on. <coughs> and make no mistake, there is nothing that Torontonians are more interested in than this fundamental question about what kind of a city we live in, one we invest in or one we do not. For those of you who weren't on council in the previous term, you might recall that we actually had debates that went, or deputation days that went 24 hours long when we did the core service review. There is no more, never in the history of the city of Toronto have I seen Torontonians come out with such passion for this city, such concern for its future, and such a willingness to give their time, their thoughts, and their, their ideas for the future of the city of Toronto as when we had a conversation about whether we should cut services or maintain them. It is the single thing Torontonians have shown the greatest interest in. And yet, despite repeated motions by this council to have a long-term financial plan debated at this council, we, our executive committee, nevertheless, chose not to send that here for a debate. How can any of us claim to be doing the thing we offered four years ago to do, which is to lead this city if we are not willing to have that debate. And it's consequential. The instructions we give to city staff on what to prepare for the new government coming in a year from now, and it will be a year from now before they're able to debate a long-term financial plan, will be rudderless for, for an entire year. The instructions we give can shape the kind of work they give us. 
Do they tell us how to build a city or do they tell us how to shrink a city? We can pass motions like that in that debate. And that speaker is why I feel it is both urgent and important that we have that debate here at the floor of council right now. Thank you. So we do have some questions. Councillor Layton, three minutes clarification. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, are you aware that a similar report like this has been in front of council now four other times talking about <coughs> revenue tools and it was all leading to us making a decision this term? Uh, yes, there, there have been numerous reports and each time one of two things has happened. In some instances, we have uh, directed staff to go back and do the work and the most recent direction we as a council gave them was to bring that work back prior to the budget we just debated. In other instances when those reports or those debates have happened, uh, a majority of the members of council have said we don't want to make up our mind about revenue tools right now, why don't we wait until we have the long term financial plan for context. In other words, every time a difficult financial decision has been before this council, we've said, no, we want it all at once. And here we are now, quickly approaching the end of term, and the executive committee has decided, no, we simply won't have it. So the report, the first key challenge that the city manager outlines in the report is this growing risk and volatility of our revenue stream, because 9% of it is reliant on the real estate. Market. Uh, the city manager outlines a number of challenges. One of them is that uh, incredible volatility. And I know Councillor Campbell and others have, have uh, repeatedly asked questions on the floor of this council saying, what do we do in the event of that volatility? And here's the scenario that concerns me. If the real estate market goes soft in the next couple of months, and there have been some indications that it could do that, and this council, because of a motion that Councillor De Bearmaker made, and a majority of councillors decided, will have no meeting in the fall. We are, we are leaving city staff in a position where council is no longer meeting for nine months, and they have no sounding from council about whether we value a continued investment in city building or whether we believe we should shrink services. We could, during the long-term financial debate, recognizing that, that potential risk with the uh, land transfer tax gives some direction to staff. But no, the executive committee does not want us to have that conversation. So the core service review didn't identify the hundreds of millions in the structural operating deficit that we have. The, the time it would take to implement a new revenue stream would be rather significant. So your reason for trying to seize this item is we can't wait another year to start addressing the urgent need that we have right now. I have, I have two fundamental reasons for doing it. One is uh, because we have this structural deficit, which is self-imposed because of eight years of this council freezing or cutting taxes while still piling on new services, that structural deficit and our reliance on the land transfer tax means that there is significant risk to our ability to deliver the services Torontonians rely on and want. Thank That's you. A, Thank oh, you. Sorry. And it's just clarification of the motion. Council Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, to you um, and through you to uh, to the councillor. Um, with respect to the the comments from the city manager at the executive committee, uh, was it your recollection as well that the city manager said that that this report uh, that the executive committee deferred out uh, could have actually gone directly to city council? Yes, uh, the city manager repeatedly, in response to questions, said he would be absolutely fine with this report coming to city council. At one point, although I, I will not remember all the qualifications and the but-fors and the various ways of wrapping it up in uncertainty that he used, he did say that if we had the benefit of council's direction and advice, that it would send a clearer message to city staff. And is it your recollection as well that in a 2006 report that actually would have set up the partic this particular report going to the executive, is that in that report uh, that this, this particular item should have been going straight to uh, city council, the re so the city council can debate it as part of the 2017 uh, and 18 budget process? So my recollection is slightly different. I don't believe it said come directly to council. Uh, I think it did say report through executive committee, but I'm not certain about that. But what it most certainly did say was that it should be before this council prior to the debate on the 2018 budget, which unfortunately did not happen. 
It's, sorry, so then I should just rephrase, and I, and I think I made a mistake in saying that, is that it would go through the executive committee in 2018, sorry, in 2016, the next steps I outlined is that it would go straight to the executive committee and then to city council for a final decision. Is yes, that that's absolutely correct. Okay. Okay. It, we're just to ask questions on clarification of the motion. That's before you. Have you have a question, I, Councillor DeBerry, yeah, maker. I'd be happy I'm to hear it. About that. I'm speaking. Otherwise, perhaps you can let the rest of us do our work. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, okay, Councillor DeBerry, maker. Yeah, Councillor Wong Tam. Just on clarification of the motion that's before you. And, so and if it carries, then there's a debate. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And then finally, for, uh, for you, Councillor, um, for for this for this motion not to for this motion not to to carry today, what are the ramifications for us uh, as a city? Well, I think there are many ramifications for us as a city, and I think that the reason okay. to, the reason I moved the motion and to clarify its intention and purpose for Councillor De Bearmaker, who's having some trouble following along. Well, I, first. I, I, First I, speaker, I think the point Prince, of the hold motion. Hold on, hold yeah. on. I don't think the questions are being asked on clarification. We're getting into the debate of the item. Please, just clarification on what we have before us. Councillor Fletcher, you're next. Uh, thank you. Are you concerned that this isn't here in front of us because it was supposed to be here? Is that the reason why you're moving that? Council had instructed it come here before 2018, uh, before the budget. So you're concerned. Yes, I'm deeply concerned. And part of the reason why I moved this motion and why I would encourage you all to vote for it is this council gave clear direction to city staff, so which the executive are, committee chose to ignore. So you are basically uh, bringing that forward so council can determine if it wishes to follow its initial and original instructions, which were to have this debate here at Council, correct? Yes, I, I, this Council, all of us together decided that this was so important that we had to uh, give the direction to all of our senior public servants to go and do important work. I can't believe we wouldn't be willing to debate it. And are you also concerned bringing this motion today because this is the city manager's report which he has been um, writing for quite a few years, getting it ready for presentation to council, and that this is actually his last meeting. So uh, we will, council will not actually have a chance to question this city manager about the report he has prepared for this council. Is that of concern to you, Councillor Kerr? Um, acknowledging my deep affection for this, this particular city manager, I would like to ask him questions, but worse than that, if we don't uh, bring this, to item, this item before us, we can't ask any city manager or any chief financial officer, any deputy city manager or any staff member, any questions about the financial future of this that. city. But this city manager, his mandate was to bring in a financial directions report. I think you'd agree with me. That's very clear. The mayor's mentioned that a number of times, that that was his mandate when we brought him here. And so now we're shortchanging our own process by not allowing this council to ask questions of a man whose mandate was to provide us with a financial blueprint. Would you agree with that statement? Absolutely, I and would agree And that's why that. you're bringing this forward. That's why I moved this motion, and Thank that's you. why I hope every member of council will vote for it. <clears throat> Councillor Davis, clarification of the motion only, please. Uh, thank you, Speaker. So the motion asks Council to debate the financial, long-term financial plan um, because Executive chose to keep it from us. Is that why you're bringing it here? Or is that the intent of your motion? That's the effect the motion that I move would have, yes. And this motion will allow Council to give direction to staff as opposed to staff interpreting their direction um, because there was no direction given by executive. Is that my understanding of why this motion is before us? Yes, and that's actually the crucial point. And, and that, to understand the purpose of my motion, I would really like members of council to focus on this point. We could have a debate on the three possible futures that the city, of, city manager has laid out in the City of Toronto. Shrink services, increased taxes just to keep things the same, increased taxes slightly more, 
so that we can actually do things like build smart track or invest in housing or all of the other things that this council has promised to do. I think we could move motions telling the city manager my preference would be to bring back a report to the new council saying invest in the city, build the city. And that way when I go out and knock on doors and all the members of council go out and knock on doors asking to, could you please re-elect me, I'll be able to say that I stand for building the city. Or if I vote differently, I stand for cutting services. I think each of us has a duty to go to voters and tell us what we have stood for and what kind of city we want. And refusing to debate that is fundamentally ducking the job that an elected official has. And you want this report to be brought forward to council because uh, it gives uh, directions and very specific recommendations for changes to the budget process and other practices for the next term. Wouldn't it be useful for this council to give some endorsement of the recommendations that are contained in this report? Okay, now I'm sorry, we're getting into, uh, you know, clarification of the more, and I don't know how many more Thank questions you. could be asked because Councillor Perks has answered why it's here. Thank you. So other than that, we're not getting into a debate. Don't use the opportunity. Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Madam Clarification. Uh, yes, well, it's a procedural clarification. I just want to uh, clarify what you anticipate to be the procedural path of your motion. In coming here, it's a report with a number of action items. Some of them are, are to direct staff to go back and do a, a significant amount of work. Your motion isn't trying to derail that, is it? No, absolutely not. Uh, the effect of bringing it here to council allows us to do two things procedurally. First of all, as was said in answer to a question at the executive committee, having the imprimatur of the entire council instead of a subset of council makes the uh, the action items in the uh, report bulletproof. It means that they're fully endorsed. Secondly, it may be that some of us look at, the, at that report and say, there's more we need to do here. We need even stronger direction to city staff on what kind of work they want to do. Do this kind of work, not that kind of work. And I think that's the job we were elected to do. So just to be clear, um, you, you, you anticipate that, that at the end of the day, Right now, it is directed to staff. At the end of the day, to clarify, you want it here to refine certain points, but the path you anticipate is it may then just go to staff as it is now, but with more input. That's all you're trying to achieve here? You're not trying to achieve any other nefarious thing? Oh, Councillor, I never do anything nefarious, but no, you're quite right. <laughs> the, the, the purpose of this is, is to send a similar set of instructions to what staff have asked us to approve, to them so that the next council that's elected can start uh, hit the ground running with an item and uh, this is important if we debate it as a council and vote on it as a council then the public as they did during the, the um, uh, KPMG report the public has the opportunity to know when they're voting if they want to go along with that direction from council. So it's not only inclusive of us, it's inclusive of every member of the voting public in the City of Toronto, if we have the courage to have the debate here now. That clarifies it for me, Madam Thank you. Before we proceed, I want to welcome the grade five students from Pristine Heights Elementary School, located in Ward 31. Their local counselors, Councilor Janet Davis, and their group leaders, Gina Perquettis. Councillor Pasternak, clarification of the motion. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm a little confused. You seem to be saying that it's a final report and ready for debate, but that's not really how the report reads, nor what Executive Committee decided. Is it a final report ready for Council, or did it go back to staff for more work? To repeat what I said earlier, the City Manager said during questions he was asked at Executive Committee that it would be absolutely fine for this to come to Council and further that if it has the, the stamp of approval from the entire Council that gives it more weight. Second point that I want to make and that to clarify what's going on here, as with all of our financial planning, as with all of our transit planning, we bring reports in stages. Should we go to the next stage of work? You're familiar with this, Councillor. So for example, prior to the previous bu uh, budget, 
This okay. council had a debate okay. on what instructions we should send to staff in preparation of the budget. This is almost identical to that, and it represents good planning, good leadership on the part of this council, and good public process. But clearly in the discussion, and you know council's time is valuable, we sent it back for more work because it was not ready for council, and you were there and you heard that. Would, would I that heard that that was your opinion, Councillor, it's not mine, and that's why I want to remove it from committee. I think, unlike you, that we have a duty to the people who elect us to have the debate here at Council and to show people where we stand. I do you want to have a government with okay, fewer okay. services, or do you want to have a government Councilor where we actually Councilor build the city? Valuable. I'd like to know how you... Councillor Perks, please. Thank you. Councillor Fragadakis, clarification of the motion only. Yes, so I just, uh, Councillor Perks, your, your motion does not commit us to any plan of action, but rather a discussion, is that correct? It, it commits us to debating the item. If a majority of us feel that we should take some action, we can do that. That's what council is for. But voting yes on my motion doesn't presuppose uh, that anything like that will happen. We'll have the report before us, just as we would in the normal course of doing business here, just as we, as Council directed, should happen prior to the 2018 budget. So if we don't pass your motion, does that mean we'll never have a chance to understand our current city manager's uh, understanding of our financial uh, situation? It means that only those of us who were at the Scarborough Executive Committee uh, will be able to have asked questions. And I also want to note um, I had further questions that I wanted to ask at that time. I asked for a second round of questions and the executive committee overruled that. I think there's some very important things that we as council and that the Toronto public need to know about our finances and I want to ask our staff those questions on the public record. Okay, thank you. Councillor Matt Lowe to speak. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I strongly encourage Council to listen to Councillor Perks advice. Um, only, only Executive Committee, Madam Speaker, had an opportunity to review and debate the City Manager's report. And the Mayor's excuse, and I heard it from Councillor Pasternak today, is that uh, the report wasn't at a point that it was fully uh, flushed out and ready to be considered. But this seemed unusual to me, Madam Speaker, so along with the reports that were already discussed today, including the revenue tools report, I looked back at other items that went through executive and then went to council that were interim reports, one of which was EX 29.1, Smart Track Project Update and Next Steps, and EX 29.2, Rail Deck Park Results of Feasibility Studies Analysis and Next Steps for Implementation. Both of these were interim reports, both of these sought a council direction, and both were considered both by executive committee and then to council, and this is just an example of many more that have been interim reports that have been then reviewed by executive, then brought to council for our direction. This is the point where we provide guidance and direction to staff. So then it makes one, I think a reasonable person wonder, then why, why would the mayor and executive uh, committee just want to bury this report. Why is it not coming to council, especially before an election? Well, the city manager made very clear recommendations that there should be value for money assessments on major capital projects. He also said that council should be ranking capital projects based on evidence, based on good urban planning principles. Well, I, along with the minority of this council, have requested several times that this council support just those two principles, actions. And this mayor in this council continues to vote against it. But meanwhile, the city manager is saying to executive committee, and I wish he could have an opportunity to say this to council, that we are facing a major budget gap, roughly 1.42 billion operating gap in the next five years. But what have we done? Well, some people have criticized this mayor for kicking the can down the road. I respectfully disagree with that accusation. I think what this mayor has done is far worse. No other city is spending over $3 billion on one subway stop. No other city in the world is rebuilding elevated expressways. No other city in the world is neglecting their responsibility to become a 21st century city 
and actually start spending money in the right places, such as making Young Street safer and doing things that modern 21st century cities do. So not only are we not under this mayor's, I was about to say leadership, but I'm not. This mayor's guidance is spending money on things that provide less service to fewer people for far more money, billions of dollars, rather than spending money wisely, investing in our actual priorities, and doing what the city manager has done, which is saying we need to rank projects by priorities, by evidence-based priorities rather than political priorities. And boy, he keeps showing us pictures of icebergs saying this is where we're heading. We are about to hit it. But rather than look out the window and see that iceberg and avoid it and actually steer us in the right direction, this mayor and sadly the majority of council has decided to head right towards it and bury any evidence and bury any advice that suggests that we shouldn't go in that way. Well, it's time to turn that ship around. It's time to actually have vision for the city. It's time to actually invest in real priorities, accept facts to guide us rather than political pursuits or other interests, serve people with every dollar that we have, use other people's dollars wisely rather than for our own interests, and do something important for the city to reimagine Toronto, to return the city to the people rather than just keep patting our own backs. So Madam Speaker, we need to have this report before us. Councillor Perks is correct that it should be seized from executive committee. And the next executive committee should remember, you serve the rest of us, you serve the majority, you serve the population of Toronto. Don't just bury things because it doesn't fit into the narrative that you'd like. Bring the information forward so we can have a debate. I represent roughly 70,000 people in Midtown Toronto who don't have an opportunity to actually consider that report from the city manager. I hope the city manager thank has a you, better... Thank you, Councillor Matt Lowe. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis, to speak. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I had the opportunity at the Executive Committee to uh, speak to each individual member of the Executive Committee to ask if they would move on my behalf a motion to bring this report forward to Council. And not a single member of the Executive Committee was willing to move that motion and be on the record about whether this Chamber, this Council, had a right to debate the most important report in this entire term of council. We have been waiting for this report because this report sets out for us our challenges and it sets out for us some proposed solutions and steps to move us forward. I represent this group of residents, these young people, these young people here who want to have a new playground, who want to have new investments in their community, who value the Taylor Creek Park, which runs beside that community, that needs investment. And I, as their representative, have a right to have a debate about this important report in this chamber. And I am glad we have found a way to at least be heard on it, our communities were consulted on the long-term fiscal plan. And they spoke clearly, and if you read the report, you will see that they support building a city. And this report sets out three visions for the future. A stark, bare-bones government that does only those core services at low levels. It talks as well about a model of status quo, but even status quo we can't maintain with the current fiscal structures that we have. And lastly, it offers an option of a city that is growing. A city that has growing needs and a city that has been successful to date but is on the brink, on the brink. We are facing a situation, as the report points out, of greater financial risk. We are needing to modernize and transform our administration. 
but we can't do it, as our deputy city manager today said, on the side of people's desks. It lays out a process for changing the budget process so that it will ensure matching what we want to do with the budget decision-making process. We have always struggled with the budget process in order to set service levels and match it with the resources to make these things happen. On the very same agenda of the executive committee was a report that I moved to go there at the same time, which is about our service plans. $1.8 billion to fund all of those services and service plans that this council approved probably almost unanimously, every one of them. Because I know that you do want to build a city. I know in your communities you want to see new investment. But every time we discuss it at budget time, we've locked ourselves in to a budget target that was set months and months in advance and driven by an election and a mayor and we have not been able to respond to the needs and the interests of our community. Every single person at that committee who came and spoke to the executive committee, they said, take this report to council. You have a responsibility to take this report to council. You know, recently I had a meeting on uh, the Taylor Creek the Taylor Creek Park and Ravine, and we've just approved a ravine strategy. And there was a woman who stood up and said, Janet, I want this to happen. And you go down and tell them I'm prepared to pay more in taxes because this is something I want to happen. And while the mayor often denies that these voices are out there, they were at every consultation we've had in East York. East York, and I believe every community across the city wants a city that is healthy, vibrant, sustainable, and facing the future. Thank you, and Councillor Davis. Councillor Carroll. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, um, I have great respect for, for my colleague who spoke last, but I'm, I'm really not prepared to presuppose what a discussion in council might end up with. I, I don't know. I don't know if we're all prepared to talk about uh, uh, whether or not people are prepared to pay more taxes or not. But I do know one thing. If you look at page 10 on this report, if you've looked at it at all, because if you're not on executive, you haven't had to up until now. So if you haven't looked at it, let me point you to page 10. Some of the actions in this document are a continuation of work already underway by staff, which right. means you should already have oversight over it. Yeah. Other actions will require direction and guidance from City Council. That's you. Some work may require investment, including dedicated staff resources, technology, external expertise, and financial resources. Those are all the things that your constituents think you have oversight over. They think you've got your finger on the pulse. They think you're watching that, and they think you have input into that every day that you come down here. But all of those things are contained in what is our financial future for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And we're actually saying, that's okay, I'll think about it another day. And what is that other day? You're gonna go through your election not even really being able to tell them what your long-term vision for the city is because you haven't been willing to discuss it with your colleagues. And you are cutting off any new member of council that might be coming in here in having any say into that. Because let's face it, we know, every incumbent sitting here knows how the first few months of council go. There's the post-election budget, and it passes in the blink of an eye. We set a certain amount of direction before we leave, which is why our, our folks out in our communities are often frustrated that the very first budget they didn't have a lot of input into because it was so rushed. And only after then will we get a look at this and even one discussion of this report. I don't think that's what your residents think is happening in this chamber. I think they think you are actually directing what's happening. But you are not going to direct this, having set it aside for four years and just gone year by year by year, you're going to set aside again until after the election 
and after an entire budget cycle. I, I actually submit that you really can't continue to let staff struggle along without giving them that long-term direction. I hate to single them out, but if you stood up and applauded Deputy City Manager Livy's speech, then I ask, were you listening? Because all of the things he talked about are really a lot about what's in this plan, and yet you don't want to talk about it. So I ask, why did you stand? Why did you applaud? If you have anything in here that made you think we could have gone a little further there, if staff are going to go away and work on this until after the first budget cycle in the next term, there's a couple of points I'd like to make clear to them. There's some things I'd like to have in the report that's coming back. I need some input. If you read the plan, I, I, I would have to ask, what were you on while you were reading it? If you don't have one single comment you'd like to make to staff in a report of this much depth, but this would be your opportunity to have that input. And then staff would go away having had, as it asks on, on, on page 10, to get some city council direction. You, council, not executive, where no one's allowed to move a motion and no one ever sponsors your motion, but here in council, where, as deputy city manager uh, pointed out, this is a very democratic place, the most democratic place he's ever worked. And yes, you have to embrace the messiness. And the messiness is, we would like to have a little more input into a report that's going to determine the future of this city for decades to come. I don't think that's a lot to ask. I don't think our time is so valuable that we can't spend a little time to determine the future of the city and all the work that staff will be doing all the time you're out in the hustings. I really think your residents expect it of you. Those are my comments, Madam Speaker. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, this is my second term here on the, uh, at City Council. Um, I didn't quite learn the lesson the first time round because we City Council has seized the powers from Mayor uh, Ford at that time. Um, but I'm certainly learning that there is something at City Hall called delay and duck, especially as it pertains to election timing and election cycles. Uh, and I've heard this repeatedly now from different members of the Toronto Public Service that there are just things that won't be discussed uh, in an election period as leading up to an election period. And, and in those conversations when we're uh, in quiet boardrooms, we're in quiet committee rooms, um, the conversations are actually quite frank. They're saying that there are just some things that, uh, that are not going to be brought forward simply because there are certain individuals that don't necessarily want that debate um, and nothing of controversy. So I've now learned that there is this thing called delay and duck. And, um, and this seems to me, uh, Madam Speaker, to be one of those examples of when the Toronto P Public Service perhaps is, uh, is, uh, is biding by the, the will of the political masters to exercise delay and duck. Uh, what does that look like? Well, in 2016, the city manager clearly outlined in his report leading up to this particular item that's not before us, uh, that a long-term financial plan will be presented to the executive committee and council in 2017 Q2. So the report that is now no longer before us, that was deferred by the executive committee, was already late. We were supposed to debate that in 2017 that was going to feed into the process of budget decision making in 2018. And why was that the case? Because it was said that reaching financial sustainability is a challenge. To achieve it will require difficult and painful decisions. These are words from the city manager's report. The city is past the point where it can defer solving its structural financial challenge. Being unable to reasonably kick the can down the road means that it must begin to address it now. So by way of the executive committee delaying and deferring the long-term financial plan into the next term of council, it triggers another piece of, um, of procedural protocol. 
under question to the, uh, the city clerk at the executive committee as we are trying to clarify whether or not this report will indeed come back in 2019 when the new council is constituted, uh, it was very clearly made, it was very clearly communicated to us that procedural uh, protocol means that the current council deals with the current business. And should it be deferred into the new term, um, it may not necessarily come back. So all that work that was that had gone into creating this next phase of the long-term financial plan, it seems uncertain whether or not that is going to come back. And so, Madam Speaker, I'm quite concerned because we do have a number of, of, of options before us. And, uh, and actually, I should say, those options may have been taken away from us. We have a number of strategies that are very good programs and policies that this council has adopted. And it was often done in in consultation, broad city-wide consultation with our residents, whether it's the ravine strategy, the poverty reduction strategy, or even Vision Zero. All of that remains largely unfunded. They become aspirations that the city will want to do one day, but we don't have the money to do. And yet, we ask residents to come out and give us their advice, give us their best, best advice and help us make decisions and build new programs and policies that will in, in, improve the quality of their lives. And then we say to them, now we're not going to fund it. We have an opiate crisis in Toronto. We are in the middle of a shelter crisis. We have a housing crisis. We have a transit crisis. And anybody who has been on, the, on, on line one will know that you have to wait three to four to five to six trains before they can get on. There is just simply no relief. We are also, according to the city manager, perhaps on the verge of a financial crisis, despite the fact that we have good credit rating. But we can simply not punt this item down the road anymore. But unfortunately, that's exactly what the executive committee has done. So, Madam Speaker, this is why this term of council, we need to be able to bring this item back to this floor of, of city council and have a truly honest and meaningful debate about how we're going to set the financial uh, path of the city forward. Thank you. If I can have, have everyone, members of council, please try to keep it down. It's uh, Councillor Davis, please. Councillor Davis. I know. Right to talk to staff. Well, you have the right to talk to staff if you want to go behind and talk to staff. Okay, to speak, um, Councillor Holliday. Speaking of rights, Madam Speaker, I call the question. Okay, there's a motion by Councillor Holliday to call the question. We ring the bells. Question. Okay, Councillor Davis, please. Councillor Shiner. We, we heard it here first. The motion to end debate does not carry. The vote is 22 to 16. The required two thirds has not been achieved. Councillor Mahavik to speak. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I am going to be supporting the motion by Councillor Perks, and I'm going to do so for the following reasons. Um, first, uh, is it right to have this debate at this time? I think it is right to have this debate at this time. Uh, when I look at the, the city, um, and the big issues facing it, I, I would say there are three. One is public transit, 
how we're going to fund it, what we're going to fund, how we're going to pay for it, how we can cooperate with other orders of government. The second issue, I think, is housing and social inequity. If we don't deal with that in the next generation, I think this great city will not be uh, as great. And the third one is municipal financing. Municipal financing has risen to the top of the agenda, and I think this, this frankly, this council owes it to our residents to support, uh, to support a full conversation on it. Secondly, um, we were promised that we would have this uh, debate on this uh, issue. There have been more motions uh, talking about new revenue tools, long-term financial planning. Uh, frankly and respectfully, I think the city manager's, uh, CEO's uh, report was weak. Um, I had thought, I had thought that there was a commitment to advance the argument, uh, to say these are the areas where we can move, these are the areas where we can't move, either, in, either with our existing tax base or with uh, other revenue tools. Um, we were promised a, a full conversation. We are not having that full conversation. Thirdly, um, it is very interesting, the uh, goodbye comments of uh, our deputy uh, city manager, uh, John Livy. It echoes virtually every previous CEO that was here, has been here, and every chief financial officer that was here. They are telling us the wise owls that we hire, that we pay big bucks to, tell us that we should have this conversation and the urgency is uh, that it is urgent before us. Fourth reason why I support this, I do think that our public are asking us to have some political courage. I think this council had political courage when we had the conversation and debate and we made some good recommendations around, the, uh, around road pricing of our QEW, or sorry, our Gardner Expressway in Don Valley. That was courage. That is something that, frankly, I stood up uh, in public gatherings and, and said, you know what, we all, all of us around this table, mayor included, of course, uh, deserve uh, kudos for having the courage to talk to our people and say, we need this right now in the city of Toronto. So it, it is time for political courage. Secondly, we have had in virtually every previous uh, council, uh, at least that I've been a part of, a discussion on revenue tools. There is a host of revenue tools out there that can help us sort out uh, the challenges that are before us. Not all of them are rest on the property tax base. In fact, if we want the $1.4 billion from the property tax base, I think that's going to be a hard, uh, hard sell for, frankly, uh, most of us, the vast majority of us. However, there are other tools that are out there. It would be good for us to signal to the province, these are the kinds of things that we are looking at, and it's good for us to signal to political parties uh, the kinds of things we are looking at in terms of uh, getting new revenue. Uh, lastly, in my conversations with uh, provincial officials, what they're telling us is, you know what, if you want to uh, advance on the issues that I indicated at the beginning, housing, transit uh, and uh, financial uh, struggle that we have, you're going to need to show us where you're at. They are challenging us to say, you can't just come to us with these great plans and say, oh, by the way, we want you to pay for it. You're going to have to put in your money for it. And it's very hard to say, okay, we'll be there with the money when we don't know, we can't even afford what we are spending, what we are, what we are committed to now. So, Madam Speaker, for all those reasons, I think the right thing to do really is to have this conversation now and give staff additional direction so that we can go uh, into the summer and, frankly, into our election uh, mode uh, with some, uh, some uh, information and perspectives before the Toronto's public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher to speak. Uh, speaker, uh, colleagues, I very much support having this debate and discussion here in the chambers. Uh, particularly for the point that Councillor Perks raised and said that as a council, we had actually instructed staff and city manager to get ready and bring us this report. And this has been a number of years that has been in the making. During that time, as you know, we've had 30,000 people a year 
are moving into the City of Toronto. That's part of the provincial growth plan, but it's also just heavy growth. So I kind of figure since we started talking about this, that's close to 120,000 new residents in generally new developments, and they're in particular growth zones. Mimico is a big growth zone. The corridor along the waterfront, central waterfront, is a growth zone. Councillor Bailao and myself and McMahon have a shoulder growth zone. And then there's the Young Street Corridor, which is an amazing growth zone, as Councillor Matlow and Councillor Affilion, Councillor Shiner will tell you. Along the transit corridor, it's an amazing growth zone. So here we are with 120,000 new residents on top of our existing residents, and our revenue is not keeping pace with the growth in the city. Our services aren't keeping pace with the growth in the city. I think we know that. So we're just banking on people moving in and perhaps using their gym in their condo, but where are the parks? Where are the recreation centers? How do we plan the childcare? Where are the libraries? Where are those city services that we know are so important? And we also know, as was so brilliantly pointed out to us last week at a Unilever meeting, big, large, hundred people, that residential growth actually doesn't bring in new taxes. It costs us money to have residential growth. Jobs growth, industrial growth, brings us new tax dollars. So here we have more people, less revenue, a report that we've been waiting for, for years, by a city manager who, as we were told, was brought here for this very purpose. He wasn't brought here because he had knew the city. He was brought here because he knew money, and he was going to give us some ideas about what we had to do. And at the 11th hour, what's happening? That discussion that we've been waiting for has been taken away. The rug has been pulled out from our feet. Now, I don't think that the executive, when it deliberated on this, took all those things into account. I just don't think they thought about their role as far as ensuring that council gets to debate things that council, particularly those folks from the growth area, have something to say, that we really need to be respectful of our city manager. His last meeting, this is his big moment. It's his big report. And the rug got pulled out from under his feet too, and from council. I think it's profoundly unfair. I don't think it's, un I don't think it's wise, and it's not how I want to go in to an election. I'd like to have some idea of what we're doing. We had great vote on road tolls and then had that rug pulled out from under our feet. What are we going to do? Everybody wants to spend money here. Put your hand up, Councillor, if you didn't, don't want to spend money in your ward to improve services. I'd like to see those hands because I know every one of you wants to do that. So I really believe that we should have this conversation. We don't need to have it today. It can be a special meeting about money before we lose our city manager to another money job at the federal level. So I urge you to support Councillor Perks's motion. Councillor Fillion. Thank you. Uh, next time you're with a group of constituents, try asking them the question, what has your municipal government, how has your municipal government failed you over the last 5, 10, 25 years? And you will get almost to a person uh, some version of lack of planning, lack of foresight, lack of vision. And it, they may give you a symptom. They may say, well, lack of transit planning. But it, it will always come up of, you don't think long term. You just think till the next election. You just, guys just want to get yourselves reelected. You don't think about the future and plan for it. And um, I think, you know, certainly the staff have been doing their job. Mr. Wallace has made it 
uh, painfully clear to us since he got here that um, we're living beyond our means and and uh, keep leveraging that um, with uh, with every budget and we have to come to grips with that how we come to grips with it is going to be it's not going to be a one-day debate here at council we need to set up a process to um, develop the the long-term plan and how we're going to pay for it but right now we're just uh, we're just living inside a house of cards and when it comes collapsing down and it will um, maybe as soon as this year um, we're you know we're going to say oh whose fault is that what's not our fault not our fault it's uh, somebody else's fault so we really need today at least put this on the agenda we're not going to solve all the problems but let's come up with a plan for developing a plan to solve the problems and we've had great leadership from our staff in telling us what needs to be done. Let's get on with the job. Councillor Kelly to speak. All right, thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, I will not be supporting uh, Councillor Perk's motion. Um, I was at the uh, executive committee meeting at the Scarborough Community uh, uh, Council uh, and I heard the, uh, the arguments uh, proposed by the uh, city manager. Uh, and uh, like Councillor Perks uh, and others, um, I support the big city uh, perspective on uh, the growth of the city of Toronto. Um, but having said that, Speaker, uh, I don't think that... Uh, by not acceding to Councillor Perk's uh, request that we will be shutting down debate. In fact, we're going to be moving into an election and hopefully there will be a very healthy debate uh, on this very issue. But I would, uh, I would say to my colleagues, Speaker, that one of the fundamental principles or understandings of government is that an outgoing administration does not set the agenda for an incoming administration. So you can say all you want right now, but the bottom line will be that this issue will be decided by the council that's elected for the next term. And I would hope that that council uh, speaker would adopt the big city approach, that it will ask for more autonomous authority to make decisions, that it would ask for more autonomy in raising revenues. But for us to make that decision on their behalf, I think, Speaker, is premature. So that's why I will not be supporting this request. Thank you. Councillor. Cressy to speak. I, well, thank you, Speaker, and, and I will be supporting the motion by Councillor Perks. Uh, I would just begin, this is my first term on Council, and it, and it is, uh, as it is for all of us, it is rapidly coming to an end. Uh, in my very first speech on the Council floor in this term, I spoke about what I believe is our revenue problem. Meanwhile, the term is about to end, and we have not, as this Council discussed, our long-term fiscal plan. We have ignored it this term. And I would say with all due respect to the comments uh, that Councillor Kelly just made, I was just reminded that it was in the last term of Council near the end of the term that Council decided not to make a decision so as not to burden the new administration with that decision and in effect punted it. And that same argument is now being made four years later to punt it again. And I, I do want to say very clearly, because I, I hear from many of my colleagues as we're talking here in the room, that to those who say that this attempt to seize this item is nothing more than politics, make no mistake, the decision to punt this item to the next term is about politics. Seizing it is about public policy. Uh, and I, I would say a year and a half ago, in the winter of 2016, um, and I will give full credit to the mayor, that. He, dis he initiated the conversation on his own regarding road tolls and the future. That was the right thing to do. 
And I believe that this council, not that it was the solution, but I believe that this council also did the right thing when we, in our articulating and uh, recognizing the need for new revenue, endorsed road tolls. And all three levels of government provincially let us down. But our response to that, and the mayor's response to that, rather than rolling up our sleeves and saying, OK, we know we needed revenue and road tolls was a solution, but now that we don't have road tolls, let's not address the need. Let's wait. That's not the proper response. The response should have been and is for us to roll up our sleeves and get to work. And, and I think there is no better illustration coming out of the recent executive committee about where we are right now than the willingness for the executive committee to allow us to debate cryptocurrency, but the unwillingness for us to debate the long-term financial plan. I mean, for goodness sakes, the executive committee endorsed council having a debate about cryptocurrency and blockchain and how that impacts the future, but said that this council should have no role in looking at the entire long-term financial plan. That's politics, folks. And so if the role of government is, and this is the role and function of government, to tax and spend and regulate, that is the role of government. How we use residents' money and to what purpose. If that is the role of government, then the role of us as elected officials is to discuss it. Today, we have no plan for the future. And so we do have tough choices. And that's the point of the discussion. As Councillor Perk said, we can do less and collect less. That is an option we can take. And for those around this chamber who say we can do less and collect less, they should stand up and make that case. And to those like myself who believe we as a city should do more and collect more, then we too must stand up and debate it. Whatever your point of view is, you, every single one of you as members of council were elected to articulate that. And to Councillor Burnside, I'm sorry, but if you have an opinion on revenue tools, you don't have to run for mayor. If you are an elected rep representative, you have an obligation to stand up and articulate your view. And so I will just close by saying that we were elected to govern. Every single one of us were elected to govern. And by punting this hard discussion to the next term, we are abdicating our responsibility and we are harming the future for the residents of this city. And again, I will conclude. Seizing this item is not about politics, it's about governing. Punting this item is about politics in front of an election. Thank you very much. Councillor Layton to speak. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I just want to try to highlight one particular thing in the time that I have to speak today, which is speaking directly to why I think there, it is important for us to have this debate now. Any delay puts the city in a worse position. Any delay. I want to tell you a little story. Friday night, my daughter came home from, from child care, wasn't exactly eating as much as she should, not really in a great mood, started cupping at her ears. Now this is the third time we've had these similar symptoms. First two times we were new parents, didn't really know what to do. But I identified immediately what the problem was. So I packed her up in her stroller. We hopped on the subway, went actually over to Councillor Fletcher's ward to, to drop in on, uh, on Danforth, by the way, fantastic service. But the children's drop in on Danforth. They immediately said, oh, this is an ear infection, early signs of an ear infection. Here's amoxicillin, boom. The next morning, Phoebe wakes up. She's in a great mood. She's in a great place. If we ignore the symptoms that might cause further damage later on, are we not in fact just, just giving up our responsibility and doing the exact opposite of what we're all here to do? The additional pain, and I can tell you from experience, if you wait a couple days and let the fever come in and, let the, uh, and, and, and more whining that comes with it, then you're actually paying for it more. And that's a lot like the debate I think that we're having here today or the lack of debate that we're having here today. I've waited three and a half years now to see this report. In 2016, we debated this item three times. <coughs> and if the, the pain of my, of my daughter's ear infections were bad enough, I, I spent a little time over the weekend reviewing some of our old debates, reviewing them, what some of us said about this. That was more painful. But I'd like to, I lifted a quote from June 7, 2016 from our mayor, John Tory, that a true multi-year honest open 
accountable plan we can put in front of, front of people. That is what he wanted then. And again, in December 2016, he said, quote, we can't go on like this. We recognized it in 2016 we needed to do something about it, which is why we put it in front of the, of the city manager. And the mayor was right to help bring this plan forward then. The problem is he's wrong now. Because what we're essentially doing is saying we don't want to have the difficult discussion, the preemptive discussion, the discussion that's going to set us back on a right course. And we don't want to leave that for the next city council. What we want to leave them is the road down to a billion dollar operating budget shortfall. Now, the reason why it's so critical that we have it now is not only do we have this budget shortfall coming, it takes time. It actually takes quite a bit of time to gear up. And I read the November si uh, 2016 city manager report, and let me, just, let me just put it in some perspective about the amount of time. Property taxes, that's something we can do immediately. Repeatedly, this council has failed to increase them to the level that has been required to achieve some financial stability. The M an MLTT increase will take six months. So if we debate this next year, then it won't be available for 2018, might not even be able to uh, be available for 2019. Similarly, reinstated the via, reinstating the vehicle registration tax would take six months to, get to, to gear up. That's again something that this council and the previous one have chosen not to do, but it would still take us well into 2018, maybe 2019. Dedicating capital levy, hey, that's something I think a lot of us can get behind. A dedicating capital levy. I believe that's technically how, uh, how the mayor has proposed to fund a lot of the transit expansion, uh, including the Scarborough subway and, 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 uh, and the, uh, the province's uh, RER expansion. That will take a multi-year phase-in, up to five-year phase-in. <coughs> now we're talking six, seven years out. Tolls, the one that we all got behind, three to seven years to actually start seeing revenue from. So if you think about it, if we decide to go the, the route of tolls next January even, it's going to put us to the end of that term. And finally, the sales and income tax that we have supported, uh, at least the sales portion of, but is a good tool for this, they don't even have the number of years for because we will have to have a steady and strong advocacy campaign to the other levels of government in order to achieve this. What better time than making that decision now before the provincial election before the next federal election to make a real statement to those parties that they can't keep ignoring the needs of cities and that the city of Toronto is willing and able to make that tough decision to ensure that our city can continue to build. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Councillor Fragadakis. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I won't take my full five minutes, but I, I, I just want to add my voice to those that are worried about uh, delaying a critical conversation that we need to have in order to delay the basis for uh, our future prosperity. And I'm also very worried and have said before that uh, how reliant we are on, um, on how reliant we have become on the land transfer tax. And, and back in the last term of council, there were many who talked about uh, scrapping it, but now it balloons and balloons. And thank goodness there was a previous council that had the foresight and the willpower to actually implement it. Um, it's really too bad, I think, that uh, we can't build on that and build a fairer, more progressive tax regime for our city. It's, uh, I, I'm saddened by it. Councillor De Bearmaker. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I will not be supporting the motion to uh, bring this into the hands of council. Uh, I'm rather surprised that there are councillors standing up today. It's, uh, you know, I guess to me triggers maybe the beginning of some elections, both provincially and locally, uh, because in 2003, when I got elected, I was invited by Mayor David Miller to a session that many, uh, some of the mem members of this council attended down in Fort York uh, Armories. And, and 2003, when I was elected. Okay, please stop interrupting. I suppose Councillor Perks knows where I was in 2003. Yeah. But I, I was invited by the mayor of the day. To, we also did it in 2006. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah. So, Madam Speaker, in 2003, I was invited by the mayor to go down and talk about the future of the finan our finances in the city. And the slides that I saw, the information that I saw, the philosophical decisions and directions that I saw, 
We're basically the same as our current city manager is showing us some 15 years later. You can reduce the size of government, you can keep it the way it is or the status quo or try to keep it the same, or you can try to grow your city government and extend your services. Those are rather simple decisions that we've been facing uh, for me for 15 years. For some councillors who have been on council for 30 years, it's probably the same philosophical discussions. So for councillors to come here today and say, this is the most important issue may, we may deal with this in the, in the entire term and we want to speak about it today. My question to you is, if it really is that important, why didn't you show up to the executive committee meeting? Some councillors, to their credit, did. Where was Councillor Matlow that morning? We published the agenda. The agenda was published on these important issues. Was he out playing ping pong? <sighs> Councillor Mahevic says that these are very important uh, items that we should be discussing. Where was he at executive? He had the right and the obligation to come to the executive committee, to give his views, to ask his questions, to do that. Uh, Hold on, Councillor De Bearmaker. Apparently, Councillor Karagiannis has a point of order. Personal privilege. I believe, Madam Speaker, that it's inappropriate for us to uh, name where other councillors were. It's not, it is not uh, something that we should exercise and it's not something that we should be partaking in. Com the the councillor speaking right now does not know if the councillor he's referring to might have had a personal appointment, might have been somewhere, and I don't think those are remarks. I think the councillor might want to withdraw them. Well, I don't think that that's a point of personal privilege. And so, Councillor De Bearmaker, continue. Thank you, and I'll take yes. the wise advice of my councillor colleague and, and try to be as restrained as he is during, during the debates in this uh, no. chamber. <laughs> so I will use my colleague as a role model in terms of my behaviour. So, Madam Chair, we have budget debates every single year. I've been here now, this is coming into my 15th year. Every single year, I think people know where I stand, but again, I'm, I'm rather surprised that some members of council say, I want to have a debate today because I want my residents to know where I stand. Well, aren't you on Twitter? You have 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 followers. Tweet out, your, tweet out your position. Aren't you on Facebook? Don't you have a website? Don't you have the ability as a councillor to actually send out a flyer to every single resident in your ward and tell them exactly how many taxes you want to raise and by what percent? You have that right as a councillor to try to blame the executive committee or this council for following the advice of our city manager is simply wrong. So if you want to tell people in your ward what your beliefs are, what your positions are, call a town hall meeting. Councillor Carroll, please. Nobody interrupted you when you spoke. Councillor DeBearmaker, please yep. continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I think it's disingenuous for people to say it was a very important meeting, but I couldn't be bothered to show up to the meeting and ask the oh, questions. Hold that on, I Councillor DeBearmaker. Hold on, I'll put your time on hold. Yes, Councillor Carroll. I'm sorry. I, now I have a point of personal privilege. I actually have a cold right now. I mouthed some words. I actually didn't make any sound, and I am really <laughs> tired of being admonished for mouthing things. Well, Councillor Carroll, if somebody can hear you at the other side of the council chamber, no, you're I'm not sorry. mumbling. No, I'm sorry, Madam okay. Speaker. I ask you again to review yeah. the tape because yeah. I wasn't speaking. Review the tape? Thank you. I will review the tape. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Let's just continue. Go ahead, Councillor De Bearmaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, oh, I, I believe that any member of this council who wants their views know on where they stand on taxes has lots of opportunities to do it. And there was an opportunity at executive committee. People could have come and spoke. They could have come and asked questions, but they didn't bother to show up. Is Scarborough too far away for them? Is that why they didn't show up? Were they playing ping pong? Were they out raising funds for, for a potential mayoral, mayoral run? I don't know what they were doing, but what I do know is they weren't there. People who want to ask questions. Point of personal privilege, Councillor Perks. Just to be clear, our election rules say you cannot fundraise before the, the signing up to run for office, and you can't do that till May, and I think Councillor DeBearmaker is impugning those of us who have said publicly they're considering a run. Yes, and I know that there have been some people. Okay, go ahead, Councillor. 
point of order, Councillor Fletcher. I was at the Scarborough Town Centre last night at 5.30. I thought that Councillor de Bearmaker should. <laughs> okay. That's not a point of yes, order. Yes, I. Councillor de Bearmaker. Thank you. I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure if shopping at the uh, Laura Seacord counts, but um, Madam Speaker. Oh, <laughs> oh. so, Councillor de Bearmaker, do you want to continue? Please continue. Yes, You've got I'll 30 seconds. To my counselor, You've got 30 uh, seconds. Councillor de Bearmaker. Councillor Karagiannis, yes. Madam, Madam Speaker, this has got to stop. This is a point of personal privilege. This is borderline insulting of where we are, where we're not. And I would ask you to tell the councillor to withdraw stop. those remarks. I yeah. will withdraw any marks that has that have offended Councillor Kerry. Okay, Councillor Councillor De Bear make you have fifteen seconds. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I he, he withdrew it. He withdrew the comments, Councillor Kerjanis. Sorry, Ma Madam Speaker, about twenty seconds. My time has already been used yeah, up. I, I know. Give me a little I know. Leeway. Go ahead. So Madam Chair, I think most people know where we stand on, on taxes. We just passed a two point one percent residential tax increase with a five percent city okay, building funding. Uh, two point six percent. Olivia Chow said up to 3%. Mayor David Miller said uh, at or about the rate Thank inflation. Thank you, Councillor DeBear, make your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Campbell to speak. Well, hopefully uh, my comments will be a little less incendiary than my, my, my seatmates here and contribute to this, uh, not contribute to the gong show atmosphere. Uh, I will not be supporting uh, Councillor Perks's motion because in my view, this, this, is, this is not an adequate report. Now, councillors talk about the need for fact-based decision-making, but there's no facts in here or direction from which we can move forward. There's nothing, there's nothing really to debate in here. There's no recommendations. There's no recommendation on property taxes or property tax increases or property tax in increase implications. There's nothing here on sales tax and sales tax implications. We've had that before, but it's not in here. Uh, the city manager uh, <laughs> said that there's still critical work to be done in order for us to make the proper decisions. There's nothing here on structural changes that we can make as a city to be, make the city more efficient and more effective. So how, how are we to make decisions on raising revenue if we don't know that part of the equation? Uh, it mentions uh, the rep there, there is a, a graph in here that points to the residential property tax as a percentage of household income. And it shows Toronto as being lower than all of the other municipalities or some of the neighboring municipalities. But of course, that discounts and, and, and doesn't take into the consideration the $800 million bite that we take out of residents every year in the MLTT. Now, the report says right here, the city manager will report to executive committee as required regarding potential future financial impacts resulting from the implementation of strategies and actions contained in the long-term plan. This, is, this was a contextual report. This was not a report for uh, calling for direction. It illustrates that we may need $900 million in investments over the next five years to maintain existing, existing levels of service. Uh, some councillors mentioned, councillors Mahavik, uh, Fletcher and Cressy mentioned the road tolls. I was the one that moved the road tolls. I recognize the city needs more money, but I recognize that the city not only needs more money, it needs to become more efficient, and we can do that. I've never been one to say there was a gravy train here, and I never will, but I know that the city can be more effective and efficient the way, the way that we manage our business. Uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, Councillor Cressy said, our job is to, is to tax, spend, and regulate. Well, we just had a budget session where we did that. We decided what the, what the increase was going to be on the property tax. We decided collectively how we were going to move forward, and we did so. So I, I guess what I, I would just conclude is say there's just not enough here. There's not enough here for me who, who would support increases in revenue, and there's not enough in, 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 in here for me to figure out how we're going to make the city more, more efficient and more effective. So I, I, I mean, in, in terms of having the debate, we more or less have just had the debate. And um, I think there was one more thing that I wanted to add. And uh, in regard to, oh, and also the, in, on public consultation. There, there has been no, there's no public consultation that we've had. We went through rounds of public consult consultations during the budget process. I sat in on many of them. Uh, and, and it sounds, it, from, the, uh, from all uh, intensive purposes, um, there, was, there was no overwhelming 
urge or push for us to, to uh, reform and change our method of taxing, uh, taxing the public. So, uh, I mean, although I appreciate the desire to have a debate on where we're going in terms of taxes and what we're going to do, that debate is about to occur where there's an election coming. We had an election four years ago. Some people didn't like the outcome of the election. But basically, the two lead, lead contenders in that election, they ran on platforms of keeping taxes at or below the rate of inflation. And we, have a, as a council, have done that. <coughs> Councillor Davis said, uh, decisions driven by an election. We, we, we're, we're making decisions driven by election. Well, that's what democracy is. We get elected. We, we make our platforms in each of our wards. The mayor makes his platform, or the mayoral candidates will make their, their respective platforms. And then we come together as a council based on the way that the electorate decides. And in fact, that is the way that the, that the council should operate. It should operate on the basis of what the electorate has decided. And that's what this council has done. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Well Councillor DiGiorgio to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will be um, very brief just to reiterate the position that I had at the Executive Committee, and that was to not support the motion that was proposed by uh, Councillor Perks. Uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting because those of us that sat there and listened to the uh, general manager go through and make comments about his report heard different things. For example, I heard that the city was very well managed and we're in good financial shape. And there really was no immediate reason for doom and gloom. And no immediate reason for alarm. Those are the things that I heard from the general manager. Yes, there might be some problems on the horizon. For example, the municipal land transfer tax revenue may go down if the real estate market goes down. But what's missing there is that if the if there's a downturn in the economy, typically, typically, the cost of government operating, i.e. doing all the road repairs and everything else, the costs go down. So while the revenues go down, the costs go down. Why? Because a lot of people, well, just watch the competition that occurs. I remember, anyway, I won't go into great detail, but there are more competitive bids brought forward. Why? Because there are some people out of work. It's not an economy where people can bid and ha bid high simply because they don't really need the contract, they currently got work, they don't really need it, so they bid high. But when you need the work, trust me, you tend to bid low or lower. So those are the kinds of things that happen in a down market. And then I hear comments. We live in a world where people apparently are willing to pay more in taxes. And yes, every, every one of us can go to our communities and bring forward a project and the residents in our community can say we are willing to pay more taxes if you can do this for my community but the reality is if you lump it all together and you say these are the projects that need to be done to make all of the communities happy next year I urge you to try and do that I urge you to try and do that yes there's somebody that's interested in protecting their ravine and they're willing to pay more taxes but my community's not willing to pay more taxes for a ravine protected somewhere in Scarborough. What we need to do to govern, as Councillor Cressy says, is to basically persuade all Torontonians that we need this kind of a tax increase to accomplish the city building initiatives. And by the way, city building is not done. It's sequential. You can only do a little bit at a time. You can't accomplish all city building goals all at once. So that's what I heard implicitly what the city manager said. And the city manager also said, look, I don't have any problem in this report being brought forward to council for a discussion. But he didn't say, what he didn't say was, but I anticipate that at the end of discussion, we're not going to be any further ahead in terms of arriving collectively at what needs to be done. That's what he didn't say. Thank you. Thank you. So that's it for the speakers. Okay. We'll vote on the motion. We can ring the bells. Okay. Recorded vote. 
The motion is on the screen by Councillor Perks. Councillor Lee, please. Councillor Crisanti, please. The motion to remove the item from committee does not carry. The vote is 13 to 27. Okay. Okay, we'll now proceed um, with uh, the agenda. Um, yeah, I know we have to go. So I will now take, I will now consider request to make items urgent and time specific. Can we uh, clear the screen, please? Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm rushing to find the page. Um, sorry about this. Yes, it is page six, item PG 27.2, Consumers Next Planning to People in Business at Shepherd and Victoria Park. Uh, I'm wondering if I can make that time specific for after notices of motion tomorrow. There's a significant amount of the community that's been involved in the consultation on it that would like to attend. Okay, we have the motion by Councillor Carroll. All in favor? Carries. Councillor Shiner. Madam Speaker, on page 7, BW 27.1, Reimagining Young Street. Could we make that time specific for tomorrow morning? That would be my motion. The first item tomorrow? Yes. Okay, on the motion by Councillor. Pardon? I didn't say anything else yet. Other people are speaking. I have another item to deal with that. Okay, well, let's just vote on that item first. I, I know. I was quiet. All in favor? Carried. And then we had another item that came from Public Works, which is uh, PG 27.5, Townhouse and Low-Ride Apartment Guidelines. Could we follow the Young Street one with that? That would be my motion. Also to have it follow the item which we just adopted, the Reimagine Young Street. And if we had to stop for the afternoon for Councillor Carroll's, I'm fine with that. Well, then also we have members' motion, and then we have to have the mayor's key items dealt with first. Absolutely. So, and we haven't started the agenda yet. Okay, all in favor? Carried. All those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held, recorded vote. Oh, sorry. But I thought you, uh, didn't you say? Wait, well, I think it was held down. Yeah, they've all been held, yeah. Okay, um, recorded vote. <coughs> Yes. Councillor Grimes, please. Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Shan, when you're seated. The 
Motion to adopt the order paper and all items not held for debate carries unanimously. 39 in favor. Okay, thank you. Members of Council, I want to stress the importance of preparing your motions in advance. The clerk staff are here to help you prepare your motions. In particular, if you intend to move a motion during the release of holds, I would insist that your motion be prepared in advance and given to the clerk. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you. I'm also reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. Member City Council follows the routine for the processing and adding of any motions without notice during the meeting. Please remember a motion that a motion without notice must include a reason for urgency. If you have an urgent motion without notice you wish to bring forward at this meeting, please give your motion to the City Clerk staff. They will prepare the ne necessary procedure motion for my review along with your motion. The Chair must agree the motion is urgent before you can seek leave to introduce it at this meeting. It will require 30 votes to add a motion without notice to the agenda during this meeting. Motions added to the agenda in this way are not subject to a vote to waive referral to a committee or agency. And I will be reviewing all motions carefully and will advise Council after each recess which motions need a motion to add to the agenda. We'll go to the first item, the Mayor's Key Item, which is on page 5, CD 26.5, Emergency Shelter Services. Are there any questions to staff? If you can put your name up, request to question staff. Councillor Fletcher. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify, because there's so many numbers, um, I want to clarify the number of emergency shelters or the number of shelters that are required over the next immediate period. Um, or shelter beds, I guess we should say. Through the chair. Uh, so. Last night, we had 6,500 shelter beds within the emergency shelter system. In our plan for the coming three years, we have the five that were in the existing plan, which was 291 shelter beds coming into the system this year. There's an additional three that Council has asked us to include in 2018 for another 240 beds. And then there is an additional 240 beds in 2019, an additional uh, 300 beds in 2020. So just to go there, you're very helpful. You said there's five shelters for 290 beds. There's three shelters for 240 beds. But you don't tell us the number of uh, beds for the, uh, sorry, shelters related to the 240 beds in 2019. How many shelters is that, physical buildings? Through the chair, that would be three additional shelters. Three. And then for the 300, how many is that? So in 2019, there would be an additional three. And in 2020, there would be an additional four. So between now and 2020, that's 5, 8, 15 uh, physical locations. Through the chair, that's correct. And for the eight physical locations in 2018, how many of those physical locations have you now secured? Through the chair, we have secured six and we have good opportunity or uh, we're negotiating with two other sites at the moment. So you have six locations negotiating for two more and so you look like you might make your eight. Through the chair that is correct. And of all of these that you're outlining, the 15, how many of those are replacements for George Street or Seton House? Through the chair, so of the 291 
uh, beds in the five shelters this year, 121 of those beds are new and 170 of them are replacement. Um, uh, 90 of those beds are replacement for Seton House. Of the other shelters that I had talked about a minute ago, none of the, none of the other ones are related to uh, the George Street Revitalization Project. Those are new. So how many more is that? Physical buildings is that for George Street? Through the chair, we anticipate in 2019 having four additional locations um, for the closure of George Street, but they are they would be replacement only. No, I understand that, but they're actually physical locations that have to be set up and built. Through the chair, that is correct. And how many beds are there overall at George Street? Through the chair, there are approximately 580 men living at George Street at the moment. So there's 580, and you have, we'll call it, can we call Seton House and George Street the same thing? Uh, through the chair, there are two locations actually on George Street. Let's call it Seton House. Okay, let's call it 580 at Seton House, Correct. of which 90 have now been replaced at one of these other shelters. Through the chair, that's correct. Although the math is a little bit complicated because we have actually <coughs> 800 um, or so housing opportunities set aside for Seton House. So we have a combination of, there's 400 uh, perm or, uh, shelter beds that we're going to use and there's 400 other housing opportunities through habitat services, uh, through housing allowances, those types of things. Sorry, for, but there are 490 people for which you have to find spaces and you're saying you will provide 400 additional locations for the 490. Through the, through the chair, that's correct. Thank you. Councillor Cressy, questions? Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I'm, I'm going to orient my questions towards supportive housing, which are, was a part of this report. Maybe just to get the context, how many people, how many homeless individuals are in our city? If we were to look at our shelter system, respites, drop-ins, does activists engage, how many homeless in our city? Through the chair, uh, last night we had 6,100 individuals within the shelter system and another approximately 500 individuals in respite. Okay. Um, do we have a sense within the shelter and respite system of what the chronic homeless population would be? And by that I mean people who are staying more than six months as opposed to in for a couple nights and out? Through the chair, uh, in 2017, we saw 19,000 unique individuals come through the emergency shelter system. Two thirds of them stayed for less than 60 days. Approximately 21% of those individuals we would characterize as uh, chronically homeless, so greater than um, six months. And so, forgive me, 21% of 19,000 would be around, do we have a number on that or I can do math after? Sorry? Through the chair, close to 4,000. Close to 4,000, okay. So if, if we're seeking here shelters to provide an emergency response, but then supportive housing to help people transition out of shelters and into permanent housing, chronic homeless number of 4,000 being an, an indicator of need, how many people are on the, the supportive housing waiting list which I know this, the province administers, not the city. Through the chair, so the province does fund and administer 7,000 support, supportive housing units. Our understanding is there is a wait list for about 14,000 uh, individuals. Okay, so there are 14,000, and that's, is that the access point system? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, so there are 14,000 people who are on a registered waiting list, which I think would be demonstrative of need, but, um, but not, an, not an exact number, because others wouldn't be on the list. Is there another measurement for what the, what the assumed need in the city is for supportive housing? Uh, through the chair, so city, we have not done an analysis on uh, the supportive housing need, although we have referenced the Wellesley's Institute uh, look at this, and the suggestion within that report is that Toronto would require approximately 18,000 supportive housing units. Okay. So the provincial on the waiting list is 14,000. Uh, a third party report has been done estimating it could be 18,000. Um, currently, 
at the province, how many supportive housing units are they building, or how many units have they committed to build? Uh, through the chair, I don't have that information, although the, the province has uh, focused on the uh, Homes for Good funding, which the City of Toronto is receiving, uh, $90 million across the uh, coming three years, $35 million of that would be for capital, uh, about $54 million would be for operating, uh, that would assist 2,000 individuals. Okay, and, and just to be clear, so that 2,000 individuals through the Homes for Good program is what the province is currently providing. We recognize there may be a need as high as 18,000. The Homes for Good program, is that supportive housing? Uh, through the chair, the intention of the Homes for Good program is to provide housing with support okay. for individuals experiencing homelessness. Okay. Now, that's on the provincial side. Now, on the federal side, there has been a large announcement of $40 billion towards uh, a new national housing strategy. Of that 40, oh, should I, I'll go to our, um, the head of the Affordable Housing Office. Mr. Gadden, of that $40 billion, how much of that has been allocated to the City of Toronto for supportive housing? Uh, through the Chair, uh, Councillor, the uh, federal and provincial and territorial governments are currently negotiating the multilateral agreements. And until those agreements are signed, as well as the bilateral agreement with the province of Ontario, we actually don't have a number for you. So just to be clear, so of the $40 billion from the National Housing Strategy, we don't know how much, if any, is going towards supportive housing currently? As I indicated, there's a number of streams within the uh, uh, National Housing Strategy uh, and through the Chair. We are awaiting the, the results of the multilateral and the bilateral discussions. Uh, and then I guess a final question, and I can... I'll go to whoever wants to answer it, it may even be the city manager, sorry Peter, uh, is does the City of Toronto currently have a council endorsed target for supportive housing units and the number we need and the timeline to build them? Uh, Councillor, uh, as part of the uh, plan that was adopted, the Housing Opportunities Plan, uh, there was a target set uh, in 2009 of 1,000 units a year. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Councillor McMahon, it's my understanding that you want to do this before our lunch break on page 4, EX 32.22, uh, that you would like to release it. Yes, so it's ur urgent to receive the money from the province. I just had questions of staff to get the uh, plan for what they're using the money for, so I'd like to release. Okay. Uh, Sorry, EX 32.22, page 4. All in favor? Carried. Councillor McMahon? Leave be granted. You have a motion to introduce a bill. The leave be granted to introduce a bill to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion of the proceedings of City Council meeting 38 oh, the on other the other one first okay the leave be granted to introduce bill 283 shall leave be granted to introduce this bill recorded vote the bill the bill Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Davis. It's the, it's the executive item that Councillor McMahon released. Councillor Mahavik, please. Councillor Layton, please. The motion to introduce Bill 283 carries unanimously, 29 in favor. Shall these bills be passed and declared as a bylaw recorded vote? <coughs> Councillor Holland and Councillor Mahavik, please. Councillor Cressy, we have one more. Councillor Bailao, please. Uh, 
The motion to enact Bill 283 as a bylaw carries unanimously, 29 in favor. Councilor McMahon, you have a motion to introduce the confirming bill. Sure, and thank you, clerks, for working hard on that. That leave be granted to introduce a bill to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion the proceedings of City Council <coughs> meeting 38 on March 29th, or 26, 2018. Thank you. Shall leave be granted to introduce this bill, recorded vote. Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Holland, please. The motion to introduce the confirming by, uh, bill carries unanimously 30 in favor. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw recorded vote? Councillor Fletcher, please. Councillor Ajumari. <laughs> there we go. The motion to enact a confirming bylaw carries unanimously. 30 in favor. Thank you. We're recessed to 2 o'clock.